with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The rumors started in the morning. Some guys in Afghanistan got hit. There's some wounded guys. And you don't know who it is at first. You don't know what team. East Coast, West Coast, you, you're just wondering. Pretty soon we we know it's West Coast guys. And you know the transition is happening. So you got two teams over there at the time, Team 1 and Team 7. And now you know you got wounded guys and then you're thinking of who who do I know? And and at this point I kind of know everybody because I've been putting all these platoons through training for the last couple of years. So I know I'm going to recognize names when they come through. And then you're waiting. And then, and then we hear hey, it's one guy. It's only one guy. And that's, that's good. You know, good. It's only one guy. How bad is he? And it doesn't sound good. And you, you're hearing reports is a massive IED. How bad? Real bad. How bad is real bad? Real bad. And then you start to ask that horrible question to yourself. Is he going to make it? And then you start getting reports back. They don't know if he's going to make it. And that's not a good sign because team guys are usually positive thinkers who we think we can survive anything. So when you hear a team guy say he doesn't know if someone's going to make it, it doesn't usually bode well. And there's a weird strange silence around everyone's kind of waiting to hear and quite frankly everyone's waiting to hear a name and waiting to hear the outcome and wondering if we're going to lose a brother and finally I get an actual call an actual call the distant voice from one of my buddies over in Afghanistan and I get the first hand report of what's going on and yeah confirmed massive massive IED I get the name Dan Knossen he's one of the platoon commanders that I just put through work up great guy humble tough locked on and I asked that question, you know, is he going to make it? And the response is, you know, something along the lines of he lost both legs and he's got massive trauma to his lower abdomen. Looks like they have him stabilized. The guys did a great job. And this is like a stall tactic, not answering my question. Is he going to make it? And the answer comes again, um, I don't know. And you sit with that for a while because there's only one thing that's going to give you the answer, and that's time. Only time will tell. And in this particular case, we were blessed because Dan Knossen did make it. He survived a massive IED that would have killed probably anyone. But somehow he was able to survive, and we can talk about that because we're lucky enough tonight to have the honor of having Dan with us here to share some of his experiences and his lessons learned from his life and from his time in the SEAL teams. Dan, thanks for 
Thanks for coming by, man. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jocko. Thanks for having me here. That was, uh, you know, one of those weird days at the teams where I, I remember this when, when you got blown up and that, you know, this would happen. You know, guys would get wounded. And you'd hear those rumors when you got into work. Someone saw message traffic or someone talked to one of their friends and it would just get, you would have so little information. And then as the time, as the day goes on, you sort of, the picture becomes more and more clear. And I, I really remember that well, um, you know, just because I was in trade at, I'd already lost guys and, and um, was not looking forward to going to a funeral. So I'm freaking glad you're here, man. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't have to go to that funeral. Um, let's start at the beginning, man. Um, let's start at where you came from and, and how you grew up and all that. Let's get to it. Sure. I'm born and raised in Kansas, fifth generation family farm from 1874. I grew up roaming around outside. I had a BB gun. I got in a little bit of trouble with the BB gun, <laughs> shooting some targets I shouldn't have been aiming at. But really, I think growing up on a farm in Kansas, I developed a a deep-seated love of just being outside. I think this comes into play later in my story. Were you, uh, was your family a farming family? Is that what you did, they did for a living? Yes, my, it's on my maternal side of the family. My mom's father, his, his, so my grandfather, his grandfather came out, this is Homestead Act, 1870s. If you farm the land, you get to keep it after a certain amount of time. And they built a limestone home, a limestone barn, still stands today. That's where I was born and raised. I was a kid, I didn't think anything of it, just where I grew up, but now I realize how special that was. 240 acres, and my grandfather had three daughters, one of whom was my mother, and so the farming didn't get passed down, and I did not grow up as a farmer, but I certainly took advantage of the tractor rides. <laughs> <laughs> and then what was your, was your grandparents in the military at all? My dad's father was U.S. Army World War II, and uh, I don't know, he, he is no longer alive. I don't know the extent of action that he saw, but he was in the European theater mm-hmm. in the uh, later part of the war. And what about your dad? My father served in the Marine Corps. He, in 1965, enlisted. He didn't get drafted. He chose to enlist, and then he chose to enlist in the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. He did three tours. And the third, and, and my father is no longer alive as well to talk about some of the specifics. And as a kid when I grew up, he didn't talk about the specifics. But generally speaking, he gave me a glimpse of life into the Marine Corps, into the military. And actually, I wanted to be a Marine in high school. My dad at the end of his third tour did one of these small teams where you're working with locals uh, kind of going village to village four-man teams that's the last thing he did and then he exited the marine corps in 1968 and and was was done and he didn't he didn't share much with you about that when he not when about up? combat when i was a kid i remember in our family room we had some old storage items and i was combing through this this is while he was still alive and i saw citations uh, navy commendation medal bronze uh, not i'm sorry a purple heart and uh, he, he was under mortar fire at one point and rendered life-saving aid to a teammate, to another Marine, and so he's commended for that. But yeah, I, I, I don't have specifics. I also found some old letters that he had written home that were pretty interesting. Just to, you know, it, it's a glimpse into my father when he was 23, 24 years old, uh, writing home from what Vietnam. What was he saying in the letters? You should have brought them. Well, we could have read them. <laughs> I think there was a mention of R and R, and probably don't need to go into the specifics. <laughs> I guess it depends who he was writing home to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what did he do when he got out of the Marine Corps in 1968? So he he ended up going uh, to business school in Cornell. Uh, he did have a degree from Iowa State. He's from Iowa, and so he had a college degree. Enlisted in the Marine Corps. 1968 gets out. He would have been 25 at that point. Went to Cornell. And my so he mother enlisted in the Marine Corps, even though he had a college degree. Yeah. Do you, are you tracking any, uh, any like decision making process on that? Was he just fired up for the Marine Corps or? I think it was a little bit of rebellion against his father and his father had said, if you're going to go in the military, 
do not go in the Marine Corps. <laughs> go in any service, not that one. <laughs> well, yeah, if his dad served in World War II, he might have had that impression that, hey, you don't want to be the Marines. You're going to be in the you know, storming beaches over in the Pacific. You want to have a more plush job, like storming the beaches in the, in the, in the European theater? I don't know. Interesting. So you think he rebe- a little bit of a rebellion? Rebellion, uh, I think. And I think he probably wanted to be part of something special. And I think that is something I've seen. Growing up on a farm in Kansas, I think you have work ethic, but you also want to be part of something special. You like to be part of a team. And it's a continuation of that, going in the military. Mm -hmm. So he gets done with business school, and then how do you meet your mom and end up in out out there in Kansas on the 240 acres of of beauty? Yeah, my my mother ended up in New York City. She was a secretary, and uh, in the office, there was a woman who introduced somehow, and I, I, I need to talk to my mother about the specifics of how they got introduced, but on the first date, she didn't like my father as well as, well as would indicate, <laughs> given the fact that later they got married, but <laughs> went out on another date, I guess, and, and they eventually moved to New Orleans. They went into the Peace Corps, were in Brazil for two years in the 1970s, and then they came back, settled on the farm. At this point, my grandfather had, was retiring. So you hold on. <laughs> we got to slow your roll a little bit. You can't just roll out Marine Corps, NOM, three tours, Peace Corps. <laughs> that's kind of, that's a freaking dynamic you don't normally see. Yeah, yeah. I think in addition to growing up with stories of the Marine Corps, I grew up with stories of life in Brazil. And this is in the 1970s in the Amazon region. So it's very remote, primitive living. My mother was teaching Brazilian kids with special needs teaching them Portuguese. Hmm. And my dad was somewhere in the realm of teaching business and uh, skills to local community people. And how long were they down there for? Two years, two year tour. And that's in the 70s? Late 70s, yeah. Did your dad like start going a little bit hippie? Was, is that the scenario? Perhaps, but when I was, my only living memory of him was not as a hippie. (laughs) But I think there may have been a stage there in the 1970s, post Vietnam. Uh-huh. It can happen. Uh huh. Interesting. <laughs> he's gonna be pissed if he just heard me say. That. He's like, "What a freaking hippie!" I was helping out the locals. <laughs> All right. So then they get married, and at what point do they move back to Kansas? Around the time the Peace Corps tour ended, and I think my grandfather was retiring, moving to the Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri. This beautiful property, the home, was there. I think my parents wanted to start a family. What better place? The land was being farmed by an associate of my father's, a grandfather's, and so they they settled, and I think shortly thereafter had me in 1980. You were born in 1980? 1980. Check. And then what's growing up like? You're out there on the farm. You're getting in trouble for shooting shit with your BB gun and stuff. (laughs) Yeah, we had a section of woods we called the Northeast Corner with a creek running through it, and I would go and just play there, try to get lost. What would you have for brothers and sisters? I have a younger sister. She's seven years my younger. So. Seven yeah. years your and younger. And she, she is a nurse. And uh, when we get later into my story, I mean, she quit her job to move down to D.C. to take care of me. Dang. Owe her a lot. Yeah. So she's seven years your junior, though. So you were kind of like an only child for a while. For a little while. I learned how to play by myself. I didn't have close neighbors. I mean, we have neighbors, but not necessarily with kids of my age. I learned how to entertain myself. And a lot of this was, it was being outside. I, I did like to read as a kid, but in the daytime, I'm, I'm outside playing. We had some dogs, some cats, some pigeons that were in the barn that I was aiming at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, going on tractor rides, learning how to drive tractors, playing sports. That was my childhood. What sports were you playing? I started baseball, soccer, gravitated towards soccer. Turns out I'm not that great at team ball sports. However, the lessons that you can learn from team ball sports really come into play later. And so I'm very thankful that even though my calling as an athlete was not as a, a team ball sport player, nor was it in combatives, <laughs> I, tried, I tried wrestling in uh, middle school. It was just awful. And then I had this idea of doing boxing. So it was my sophomore year in high school, I went to the local Topeka Golden Gloves gym 
and uh, said, you know, I want to take some lessons. And so I remember my dad would drive me there and back. And eventually I started just driving myself and I would go and train in the local boxing gym that resulted at one point in going to a, a competition in Kansas City. And Kansas City's a big deal mm -hmm. when you're from a farm in Kansas. I went to this tournament in Kansas City and I remember there were hundreds of people in the audience. It's kind of in a more underdeveloped area of Kansas City, if you will. And uh, I remember seeing my opponent's older brother was just laying waste to someone <laughs> on a previous round. <laughs> And so I'm thinking, I was just so nervous. I get in the ring, and it was three rounds, very amateur. In the first round, he just laid into me, and I had the standing eight count against me. The second round was fairly even, and the third round, I actually gave him the standing eight count, but it wasn't enough because I just got whooped that first round. So I lost the fight. So you I, lost the fight. My dad was there watching, and afterwards we went and had some, had a meal, had dinner. And I just remember him kind of saying, it's okay. He did a good job. <laughs> and that was my that was my one and only competitive boxing match. The thing you gotta remember, Dan, is like wrestling, like if you go quote, try wrestling, you're gonna get your ass kicked. It, like you, there's, it's not, people think wrestling and boxing, they think it's like uh, a primal thing that you're just gonna be able to do. But man, there's all kinds of skills involved in that stuff. Well, this is, I started to think that if all you know is winning, that's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. I've spent a lot more time in the not winning realm <laughs> than the winning realm, and I can tell you that when you're not winning, it forces you to adapt, it forces you to look at what you're doing, how can you be doing things better, it forces you to grow, challenges you, and I think there's a if sport is just about character development, which I really think that's what it ultimately is about, then there's a lot to be learned from not winning, and it's you need to seek out people who can beat you in order to get better. Yeah, yeah. So what did you play sports all through high school? I did soccer. What did you was, end up excelling at? Any of them? I was a I was a varsity soccer player, defender because I didn't have good ball skills. Even as a, a freshman, I didn't always start. I was more of a bench rider, but I, I did earn a varsity letter as a freshman and it started starting in, as a sophomore, and then was a was a varsity player all four years. My last semester as a senior spring I knew I was going to the Naval Academy and we can get into the you know the reasons of why I wanted to go there but I, I knew I was going and so I decided to join the track team distance running I thought I got to show up to the Academy ready to go ready to you know bust out a 1.5 mile run track had a two mile event a one mile event so I signed up and uh, it, it turns out in soccer, I was really good at running, but not so much <laughs> kicking the ball or passing it. As a defender, I just try to kick the ball to one of my teammates who could actually do something with it. But in track, I was pretty good for one season track athlete. I, I ended up running a sub five minute mile, uh, had a, I don't know, a 10, 32 mile. And so I thought uh, endurance sports could, could have been my thing. I just wasn't exposed to it earlier. Mm -hmm. I certainly wasn't exposed to cross country skiing as a kid from a farm in Kansas. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, so you end up going to the Naval Academy. how did you get interested in going to the Naval Academy? Well, I don't want to say that my father pushed me in that direction in no way whatsoever. I found a, he wrote me a letter when I did get into the Naval Academy and he said that his childhood dream was to go to the Naval Academy, but he didn't have the grades mm. and didn't even apply. But I didn't, go, I didn't choose to go to the military in the sense of it feeling like a decision. It just felt like this is what I'm supposed to do. It really did. I wanted to be a Marine. Did you apply to West Point too? I did. That Force was my Academy? West Point was my backup plan. Oh, I got, and I got into the best one, the Naval Academy. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to combine military service with continuing my education. And I felt like as an officer, I would have leadership responsibilities and this would be, I had read books, you know, Vietnam still fascinates me. And probably a large part of this is due to my father having been in the Vietnam War. But I would read anything I could get my hands on about special operations in Vietnam, infantry platoons, Marine Corps. So I was very, very much keen on infantry, small unit tactics. I ended up signing up for the local U.S. Naval Sea Cadets program there was a Naval Reserve unit in Topeka, Kansas. So we drive there and it was kind of modeled after reserves. You know, one weekend a month you show up and you, you drill. Mm -hmm. The summers between your academic years of high school, 
you get Navy training. It starts with boot camp in Great Lakes. So I went to Great Lakes the summer before my junior year of high school for two How weeks. How old were you? I was, I was 15, okay, 15, 16. Weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Not a, not an actual boot camp, but mm-hmm. it's very much you're in Great Lakes, you're wearing dungarees, you're marching around, you're getting yelled at. And I'm just in high school. <laughs> I don't, don't remember ever <laughs> signing a waiver. It, but they had this training called SEAL training. I had to do one other training before that. So after that summer of going to Great Lakes for boot camp, I went to amphibious school in Virginia. And again, I'm 15 or 16. Cause I had to knock out one, one of these before I could be eligible for SEAL training. Now, in order to go to this SEAL camp, which is going to be the following year that I would be eligible, the summer before my senior year, I have to take the, the, the BUDS physical fitness test, 500-yard side stroke mm-hmm. and push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, and 1.5-mile run. So I started training for it, and I was just horrible, horrible at swimming, just horrible. But I somehow got under the 12-minute time or whatever <laughs> to cut off, barely. And so they they put me out to Virginia Beach, Little Creek, for this uh, two-week camp. And it starts with a... What year is this? This would have been 97, 1997. So this is actually run by active duty team guys putting these high school kids (laughs) through this washed down version of hell week. We had a hell night. It started off. And I remember... That was a continuous, it was a 24 hour thing. Started sometime in the day and sometime the next day. Go through the night, running with boats on your head. And I remember at one point running with a boat on my head. I was on the left side of the boat and an active duty Navy SEAL is just yelling at me because I was- Do you remember who it was, buddy? I I don't, I don't. I remember there was a Chief Blackburn. And he, and and this, the, the particular individual in this story is not Chief Blackburn. I was slacking off. And he just laid into me about how I wasn't being a good teammate. And I'll never forget that. It just cut right into me. And I came back. We, after that, we got to shoot MP5s. We got to do the water off school course in Virginia yeah. Beach. And it's just as a high school kid, I mean, this is amazing. But uh, truth be told, I didn't have perfect eyesight. And I just was horrible in the water. So when I did get into the Naval Academy, my preference was for the Marine Corps. So all that hoo seal stuff didn't get you like oh, it, totally brainwashed? <laughs> I was brainwashed just sitting over here listening to you tell that. If I would have been 15, it would have been a done deal. It, it was, but I just didn't think. How bad was your eyesight? I had a chance. It, it, was, it needed to be correct. It wasn't, it wasn't within 2040. It wasn't, certainly wasn't 2020. At this point, I didn't know about corrective surgery. Mm-hmm. I didn't even, that wasn't even a thing I, at the Naval Academy. I thought... I can go in the Marine Corps infantry, be a platoon leader, yeah, a company sure. commander. And so that's what I was leaning towards. I mean, absolutely though. When I went to the Naval Academy, the SEAL program was extremely intriguing to me. I just didn't think I would be eligible. Why would you set yourself up just to be disappointed? Chuck. So anything else from high school before you roll out? How hard was it to get uh, like all the congressional recommendation and all that stuff. You know, I don't think it's that hard when you're applying to the Naval Academy from Kansas. Now, it may be different now, but if I was applying in Virginia or California or Texas, Maryland, Virginia, Mm. the the geographically proximate states, they're very competitive. But I had good grades. You know, one thing I should say is by the time I was a freshman in high school, I was fortunate enough to have this goal of the Naval Academy inside me. I don't know how it got there, but it was there. And so it then becomes a matter of, well, what do I need to do to get into this place? It's going to be really hard. Okay, you got to have good grades. Check. (laughs) I'll study and get good grades. You got to demonstrate some athletic talent. Okay, well, I'm already doing that. That's just, that was easy for me. Leadership. Okay, well, I'll try to be a sports team captain. I'll try to run for student government. I'll do the sea cadets. And uh, that's kind of how I structured it. And so I think as my story unfolds, you'll see, I tend to be a fairly goal oriented person, but this is something I think is very, it's very important, but not to force the goals. But when I have these goals naturally, I feel like I can just be ignited because this is driving me forward. And that's what was happening as early as my freshman year. And that's why I think I'm very fortunate because if you make this decision, you want to go to a service academy in your senior year of high school, it's too, it's too late. Too you got to start the process in your junior year. You do have to get a nomination from 
either senator in your state or from your congressional representative. And they're in, coordinate, they're in communication with the academies, and I think the academies kind of lean them towards the candidates mm. that they are already identifying. And you have no, oh, where did you hear about the Naval Academy for the first time? You don't remember? It had to have been in a book. Mm. I mean, I would just, I remember watching movies like Predator and just, <laughs> just <laughs> how, how come Echo didn't end up at the Naval Academy? <laughs> he was watching well, Predator yeah. a lot more than you were. Oh yeah, probably was reading some books on a platoon leader in the Marine Corps in Vietnam or, or something, mm. Naval Academy. I, I think I think how it actually happened was at one point I wanted to be a pilot, but then, you know, the eyesight thing, it's just, it's not happening. But to be a pilot, I mean, you start getting aware of the service academy because to be a pilot, you have to go to a commissioning source. Yeah. So when you show up at the Naval Academy for like plebe summer, you must be pretty used to this kind of crap because <laughs> you've, yeah, already, you've already been to boot camp. You've been had a bunch <laughs> of team guys in Virginia Beach who were freaking crushing you. It really was not that big of a deal. And Plebe Summer is this six week indoctrination. It is not boot camp, but it is a service academy equivalent of boot camp. Your class is about 1,200 incoming freshmen report in the middle of the summer. July for about a six week indoctrination into the military that occurs and ends before the academic year. And on, on the note of the uh, sea cadets, I will say that at the end of my plebe year, freshman year at the Naval Academy, I was invited back to be the class leader. And I did do that. And that was just an awesome leadership opportunity. I could be the class leader. Class leader of what? Of the incoming sea cadet class of high school students. So oh, okay. as a, as a, now, done with my plebe year at the Naval Academy, I'm the class OIC of this group of high school kids coming from all over the place, running through the same thing I had been through two years before at this point, because the other summer was plebe summer. And how did you like the Naval Academy? Well, it was... It's like a love-hate relationship, right? Yeah, you know, there's this saying, I-H-T-F-P, I hate this place. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, in high school, I had friends, but I didn't have what I would call deep connections with the people that I was going to high school with. And I, I definitely had friends, but when I was in the Naval Academy, for the first time, I'm finding people that I really see eye to eye with. I mean, really quite bonded in this way of looking at the world the same way, like just common interest, common personality, this kind of thing, but to a person. And we found each other. We weren't in the same companies. They all wanted to be selected for SEAL training, all of them. What was that telling me? A couple of these individuals were recruited swimmers, all American high school swimmers. Now they're varsity swimmers as freshmen at the Naval Academy. One, actually two were really good boxers and <laughs> found that out the hard way, trying to <laughs> spar with them a little bit in the ring. And then, you know, there was me, a farm kid from Kansas, and, and you know, I just was not comfortable in the water. The, the, the truth of it is, in plebe summer, I excelled physically in anything that was on land, <laughs> but anytime we had to do something in the water, and this is maybe two times a week, you have to demonstrate to the Navy that you can float that you can take off your camis, camouflage uniform when you're floating, and tie them and, and, and inflate them to help you float. Mm-hmm. You have to demonstrate that in the event that you fall off a ship, that you're not a total liability, that you can swim from one side of the pool to the other. This is what you're doing in plebe summer. And on those particular days, we're marching, it's hot out, I would have knots of anxiety in my stomach, palpable. Were you scared of failing or were you scared of drowning? I was scared of the water. I just didn't have a lot of exposure. <laughs> now, granted, I'd gone to this seal, sea cadet seal thing, but there wasn't, there was a little bit in the water and that stuff petrified me. So, I mean, you know, and it, given what I ended up doing, one could call into question my career decision making <laughs> skills, given that this reality when I went to the Naval Academy, I was just very, very scared of the water. But by the end of this first year, I had met my circle of friends. They all wanted to, pretty much to a person, wanted to be selected for SEAL training. And so 
Are these guys all in your same class? Same class. So we're we're plebes, freshmen, and, and they're just down for the seals. Yeah. And y- how long did it take for you to start thinking that in that direction as well? I would say by the end of my first year there, I no longer wanted to be a marine, and I wanted to be selected for a seal program. But I knew that I needed to get in the water and start training, get better. At what about your eyesight? Had you now learned that you could get corrective surgery? That year's class, 1999, was able to get PRK. So that was a game changer for me. And then it's like, okay, well. So you weren't the class of 1999. No, I was class of 2002. So that in in the. So you watched the guys that were going to graduate in 1999 or that had graduated in 1999. Yes. And who were were going to buds. And for those uh, listening, there are at the time 16 billets from the Naval Academy graduating class to go to buds SEAL training. And those class those billets are split over multiple classes but 16 graduate and get to go to buds and that service selection happens around january of your senior year so as a freshman in january i'm seeing who gets picked and i had just heard that that some of these individuals had prk to correct their vision so that that they may have had that done a year before or something but but that this is this is a game changer for me i just need to get better in the water because uh I I was awful. In addition to being scared of the water, borderline scared, just could not swim. (laughs) So, so do you start spending extra time in the pool? Does someone grab you and coach you and mentor you? Like, how do you start getting through this? Well, I had a a good buddy who who became a team guy, and we just started training together. And uh, yeah, I would figure it out myself. You know, we work on jump proofing. We'd work on swimming underwater, twenty five meters, something like that. Working on the stroke. Working. I also had this goal of trying to make the triathlon team because that year, the senior class, out of those 16 billets going to Buds, I want to say five came from the triathlon team. So, well, that's a team that could be good to make. It's not a varsity sport, so therefore, you know, you don't have to be recruited. It's a club sport. Let's get in the water and start training. And I was always a very good runner and, and good at cycling, so I thought I'll, I'll train for triathlon and along with my friend. We started training. We would just go on these adventures, running, running or cycling with our fins strapped to a backpack out to Bay Ridge or into the Chesapeake and just then go fin swim in cold water, come back, get on the bike or run back to the academy. Just doing fun adventures like that. And it just started pushing my limits. What were you majoring? What did you major in? I chose to major in English. The service academies are geared towards science and engineering. And I am, they said, Plebe year chemistry is a good identifier of whether you will do well in <laughs> engineering and science if you want to major. And they call it group one. And then group three is more the humanities. Uh, pl- first semester chemistry, no problem. It was a repeat in my high school. But second semester chemistry was new stuff. <laughs> it just was over my head. And so I thought I had a very influential English teacher in high school, Mr. Schultz. And in addition to my parents really exposing me to reading and and just, I love, I still love to read. I read a lot. This teacher really inspired me to, to want to be an English major. If you, if this is what you like to do, do it. And there's benefit from this. I thought you're going to, you learn about people, you learn about situations, you develop an ability to empathize or hopefully with other people and communication skills as well. This is all very important in the military. So you decide that you're going to study English while you're at the Naval Academy. Correct. And are they like, what part of English are you studying? Like, I mean, (laughs) that just seems kind of strange. It's English lit. It just was called English there, but Uh it really is. It's not, I mean, I think they had some writing classes or creative writing, this kind of thing, but really it's the study of literature and my favorite class was a class on Hemingway. And as a kid, I had read Hemingway and I, I read A Farewell to Arms, For Whom the Bell Tolls. And these are books very much about war mm-hmm. and the wartime experience. So as you're going through, at what point are you starting to compete and you're starting to look at, hey, how am I actually going to get selected? Because, you know, you say there's 16 billets and that is it's as competitive as it gets to get one of those 16 billets. What do you think you did that was able to make you stand out and actually get selected? I remember plebe year, we were in an auditorium. I think this is during plebe summer when the whole class 1200 people is assembled and they're saying, who wants to be an aviator? 
six hundred hands go up. Who wants to be on a ship? Six hundred out of roughly twelve. Twelve hundred, you know. Okay. I'm estimating right, right. who wants to be on a ship, and you know, a few hundred. Who wants to be a Navy SEAL? And like two hundred, one hundred and fifty hands go up. Easy. But by the time it comes around to the junior year, we really got to start making things happen. I feel like there were maybe sixty or seventy in my class that were kind of very much gunning for this. You have to do a screener weekend in order to get ready for mini buds. Mini buds is a three week program prior to your senior academic year. You, so you'd go there to Coronado. Did you go to mini buds? I did. I had to do the screener weekend in the fall of my junior year. And in that you're ranked based on a PFT physical fitness test. You go through about two days of just hazing essentially from the seniors, the upper class who have gone to mini buds as if that really qualifies them to do this. But, and then from that, the if you survive, badass, yeah. <laughs> most badass instructor, they've been to mini buds. Yeah. But at the time, you know, you're revering They're, these, they've been to mini buds and some of them are going to go to buds. And uh, if you get through all this, then you can go to mini buds and then ostensibly you're ranked out of that. And then it goes into your senior year. You do an, another fitness test that gets ranked. You do a pure evaluation. We evaluate who do you want to go to buds with? Who do you not want to go to buds? So with? you got selected to go to mini buds. I did. Yep. And and how was mini buds? Yeah, I thought it. I thought it. I did well. It's I, three weeks long. Yeah, this is my first time going to Coronado, California, and I fell in love with the place. Yeah. Being from Kansas, I was just like <laughs> this. This is awesome. We had the weekends <laughs> off. I think we did a hell night similar it, very similar to the Sea Cadet thing I did, except now it's in Coronado as opposed to Little Creek, Virginia. And then it was just exposure. You know, in high school, I'd been shooting MP. They let us shoot MP5s. And uh, I don't think we even did, got to do anything that cool in mini buds. Mm -hmm. I think some of it was just going out to La Posta and doing some land navigation in the heat. But it was just a really good time with my buddies from the Naval Academy. And then after that, I got to go to Navy Dive School because I had done a screener for that. And that's in Panama City, Florida. And I think that really was helpful for me, given my, my uh, insecurities in the water to go to dive school five weeks in Panama City, Florida, learning how to dive uh, twin 80s. Mm -hmm. how, how long was it, five weeks? It was five weeks. So that summer before my senior year, it was just, for me, it was just the best summer. Mini buds for three weeks, dive school for five weeks, <laughs> come back senior year with a, a dive bubble. Not that that's, I mean, just at, in the school, like that's kind of a big deal to have a dive bubble. Oh, uh, you were kind yeah. of a badass. <laughs> <laughs> and you get done with all that, and now this is like September 2001, right? This is like September 11th, 2001. It's going to go down for right before or as you start your senior year. Yeah, I remember September. I I'll never forget that day. I had cla a late morning class, and I went out for a run that morning. And out outside of the campus, outside of the yard, and as a senior, you're allowed to do that. I came back to the gate, and... They wouldn't let me in. I didn't have my ID. You don't need to run with an ID. Why are they asking for my ID? And then I came to find out what had happened. I went back to the dorm where we all live. I changed into my uniform, went to class, and you're seeing seeing the replays. I didn't see it live. But uh, things totally, totally changed. I mean, that day, the academy was on lockdown. We didn't know what was happening. We had heard the Pentagon had been attacked. Of course, the towers in New York. And for me, this really drove home this reality. If I get selected for SEAL training, and I'm not going to know until January, I'm going to be directly involved in the nation's response to this. We're, this is for real. It's now we're, we're at war. And there's a decision that anybody wanting to go to BUDS has to make. It's this decision of what are you going to put as your second choice? And the theory amongst the majority of my friends, in fact, I think all of them was, well, if you want to demonstrate that you want to be a SEAL, you need to put ships as number two, because that's the best way to laterally transfer. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go to Newport, Rhode Island for surface warfare officer school. You'll do a tour in the fleet, and then you can put in your package and you can come to BUDS two years later. For me, I was thinking about this long and hard. Cause you're trying to game, you, you want to get one of those billets, but you don't know if you will. 
It's very competitive. At this point, there's probably 45 guys that are up for this. And these guys are like varsity wrestlers, varsity swimmers. Yeah, you know, water polo. Water polo badasses. Yeah. They're destroying the PST. They mm-hmm. got a 4.0 mm-hmm. GPA. It's like just studs. Yeah. So for me, I, I thought about this, and I, I put the Marine Corps as number two. You have to go into an interview board, and this happens in the fall. And th- this board was happening after 9-11, and it's com- – Comprised of senior SEAL officers, uh, mid middle range SEAL officers, a couple lieutenants at the academy at the time, and then some senior enlisted SEALs. So this is intimidating. It's a panel of maybe eight to ten team guy off, uh, officers and enlisted that you know you just you don't see a lot of tridents at the academy. So when you do, it's it's just intimidating. Dude, and, I, I when I went to boot camp, there was one SEAL there, <laughs> and like. I saw him years later, like probably two, two or three years later. He he had gotten out and was going coming back in, and so he was mm-hmm. at boot camp, like going going through some basic like wickets to get reinstated in the navy. And he had a trident, and you know, I was like, oh my god, it's a freaking real seal. And when I met him years later, to- totally good dude. But if you would ask me, what was the height? and approximate weight of this guy that you saw that was a SEAL in boot camp, I would have said, oh, he's probably, let's call it probably 6'5", 260. Because that's what he, in my mind, that's what he was. And I met him in real life and he was like like 5'11", you know, 190, you know? And that that's legit, like I legitimately thought that he was like that badass. And I was young, I mean, but still, that uh, when you're that when you're young, and you see that <laughs> that freaking chicken for the first time. You're like, oh damn! So you're going to this board with eight of these dudes. Yeah, one of, in the highest ranking officers in 06, a SEAL captain, and I don't know anything about the ins and outs of the SEAL teams, <laughs> but this is intimidating. And everything, everything seems to, you know, depend upon my performance right here, right now, in front of these people. And so I just remember standing outside the room that the guy in front of me is in there, you know, he comes out and, and I'm like, well, how was it? You know, he's like, like shaking his head. Like it's tough. So I go in there and, uh, you know, they, they asked me, I think they were leading me down. So why are you an English major? Do you write, do you, do you like poetry? Do you, do you write poems? <laughs> and I'm trying to say, well, you, sir, this is about, uh, it's about learning of other people and understanding situations and developing communication skills. And I think that'll serve me really well in, in the community. If I'm, if I have the honor of being selected, then they, they said your second choice, you're not putting down service warfare. What's going on with that? And I said, well, we're at war. I'd rather be in the Marine Corps. If I can't go to buds, I'd rather lead an infantry platoon. At the time, I didn't know. I, th- I think, looking back, that's probably the right answer. Yeah. And I really did. I don't know if the Marines would have taken me. The rumor also was, you put them as second, they're not going to yeah. take you. I've heard that that's like a real catch-22 for guys at the academy because they want to go in the SEAL teams, but there's so few billets. But if you put Marine Corps as number two, the Marines are like, are you kidding me? Your Marine Corps should be number one later. Mm-hmm. So that's a bummer. But that I've heard that as well. Yeah, and, and, and truth be told, I think I'm not going to game this. I'm just going to rank my choices. And, and honestly, there's a lot of things I'd rather do than be on a ship. And so I'm either going to make it or not into, the, into buds, and maybe the Marines will take me, maybe they won't. But I remember exiting the interview thinking, I have no how idea how that went. It probably it felt like it was forever, but it was probably half an hour. And dude, you know nothing. I'm just sitting here like <laughs> laughing. Dude. You know nothing you about know, anything. <laughs> I know they were in in retrospect they probably knew the people they wanted and maybe a couple were on the fence i don't know where i stacked in there but they probably were just screwing with it they probably laugh after after you leave they're probably <laughs> did you meet any of these guys later in the teams absolutely yeah did they debrief you at all did they even remember you the company officer at the academy was there and uh, you know I, he's he's still in and you know we've uh, i have not asked him specifically <laughs> about that but they uh, i i was i was ranked fine i found uh-huh. out afterwards so you were ranked fine. You find out in January. That's when you find out what where you're going. That is yes. There's a, a day called Service Selection Day. It, you're gonna go into oh. your company officer's room. Every company there are 30 companies at the academy. The whole every company is comprised of all four years. 
in that company has a company officer from either the active duty Navy or Marine Corps and then a company senior enlisted from the Navy or Marine Corps. So you go into the company officer's office and he's or she is going to tell you what you've been assigned. And this is your fate. You don't get to, (laughs) this is what you're doing. That's not a debate. No, you don't get to say, well, this or that. And if you're assigned to a ship later that night, you get to choose. And it's somewhat of a lottery system. I think it actually depends on class rank. You can choose what ship you want to go on. But you don't get to contest the fact that you were assigned surface warfare. Mm -hmm. So I go in there and he's printing off a a certificate that's going to tell me my fate. And his back is to me. I just remember, it's just my heart is pounding. What did you think your chances were? At the time, I thought about 50 50. 50 50, check. So I go in there, and the first thing he said was, Don't worry, you're fine. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> you, know, you got what you wanted. I'm like, so I remember just feeling absolute relief. And then about maybe five minutes later, it was like, I'm going to Bud's. <laughs> Whoa. And now I'm already starting to feel this apprehension because hell week, yeah. second phase, yeah. <laughs> you know, water, <laughs> I got to get ready. <laughs> uh, how many of your buddies didn't get picked up? Like well, of your good buddies. One of my, and how was that whole freaking yeah. relationship thing? Cause you know, there's like two guys that were like faster than you. And there was another guy that was smarter than you. And another guy that was like a, better wrestler and you're just going Sheesh. yeah by and large most of my best friends got a billet but one of my best friends did not and uh, one of my other buddies who did the guy that I was going on the adventures with we, we came up to his room later that day and he started crying in front of us I won't forget that either we all wanted this so bad but I think it was it was more than necessarily the job it was this is what your buddies are doing you want to be with your teammates it's so yeah it's a challenge and you're intrigued by that but it's about teamwork and he was crying and man I felt bad for him and you know going on to buds wanting to stay in touch with him not knowing how to navigate how much do I tell about what I'm doing Mm -hmm. or do I try to protect his feelings and not really you know "Ah, it's it's you know this or that or whatever but I am proud to say that Later on, when I went to a team, another friend of mine, we spoke to the commanding officer and who apparently had good rapport with the detailer. And uh, we said, there's this guy, it's the individual who did not get the billet mm-hmm. that year. And uh, he was able to lateral transfer and he is the commanding officer of, of a team, a team right now that's freaking <laughs> which is awesome yeah i mean uh for me when i was in when i was tasking a bruiser stoner and Leif, both those guys didn't get picked up out of the academy mm-hmm. and they both had to go to the fleet and do the whole lat transfer thing and you know it's all just man it, like you said it's your fate is in the hands of all these different things and you can push it and that's a great story you know it's a great story when guys actually stick with it and go to the fleet and do that lateral transfer thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's, that's a game. I'm glad I didn't have to play. Yeah. In many ways you were smart, but I will say, I remember there was in the plebe year, the individual who did not get the bill, who is now doing quite well in the teams, who, you know, uh, he, in freshman year, we were talking about what are you going to decide for your major? You know, you don't have to declare until the springtime. I was like, I'm going to do English. And uh, he goes, I think I'm thinking computer science. <laughs> and uh, so he, he chose computer science and his grades were not the best. Oh. And so it's, for me, this was English was such a good choice. Clutch. The clutch yeah, choice. I, had, I could, I, I happen to be someone who likes to read and I can maybe not always read all of the book, but still write a decent paper, focus on my <laughs> math and science and engineering classes to try to get at least a B in those classes to try to have good grades because they are evaluating everything. And part of that is your grades. So September 11th goes down, you get picked up, you're in your final prep. You must've been feeling decent about the water now that you pass Navy dive school. Yes. I'm much more confident in the water. I felt like i had improved a lot. And I knew that anything on land, <laughs> I'm going to be just given the perspective of, 
of being borderline afraid of the water that I could use this to my advantage. I've overcome a fear. I'm used to being afraid of the water. Mm -hmm. There's actually a strength in that, learning how to overcome something. What I did was I walked up to the water's edge just about every day there at the academy for four years and literally immersed myself in this environment that I am uncomfortable in. And come to find later, I had a distinct apprehension of jumping out of airplanes as well. And so oh, really? SEAL stands for sea, air, and land. Sea and air were not my thing. <laughs> But the processes of overcoming this fear of the water serve, I think, have served me quite well. And so there's this, I think, inner strength that can come from approaching situations that make you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You get through this. You take it one small step at a time. Work on something. There's always something you can work on. Do one thing today. Do another thing tomorrow. Over time, this will accumulate and grow. Yeah, I've thought about that too. Like, uh, you're jumping out of airplanes, you're fast roping, you're rappelling, you're diving, you're diving at night. All these things that are a little bit sketchy if you're not comfortable with them. And, and look, the first time you jump out of an airplane, even if, like, for me, I thought it was going to be fun, but it's still a little bit sketchy. First time I fast rope, like, hey, this seems like it's going to be fun, but it's still a little bit sketchy. First time you rappel off the tower, seems like it's going to be fun, but it's still a little bit sketchy. Well, you're building up sort of the mental protocol to be in a fearful situation and just like proceed anyways, which I think is really good for the first time you're going into combat. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I know those little butterflies. No factor, I'm gonna push through them. That's probably a probably a pretty good reason just to do those things in the first place. Of course, you <laughs> it sounds like you did it more than I did. <laughs> yeah, I think the first step here is acknowledging what's going on. Yeah. You know, I, okay, this is the situation. I'm uncomfortable in the water. Okay. Yeah. Check. Let's let's come up with a plan of action now. But yeah, going into buds. I remember we graduated May 24, 2002 from the Naval Academy and my report date at Naval Special Warfare Training Command buds mm -hmm. is late June 2002. So I had about a month off. We got to choose of the 16 of us who we're going to go to buds with and in what order. And it was split over three classes. And I was in the group that was going to go first. And so we weren't going to have the stories from, mm -hmm. and I thought this, this is actually probably good. I, I was happy with the first, first off the deck because we're not going to see Naval Academy classmates who are further along, who maybe can give some wisdom, but they're also through various stages. And, and I just, I'd rather just be the first one to mm -hmm. go. And so that worked out well. There's a definite like the Naval Academy guys usually do well at buds and if they quit, they're just like hated by everyone because they took a billet. They took one of those 16 billets and everyone just can't believe that you got this opportunity and freaking blew it. Like, I mean, yeah. the enlisted guys, like I didn't care. I mean, when I was an enlisted guy going through, I didn't care if somebody would quit for whatever reason. I was like, oh, whatever. But Naval Academy guys, they take that shit real <laughs> personal. There's some pressure, but I also think that can be an advantage. I went out to... Coronado, we, the six of, so there's actually, there's going to be six, five, and five in mm -hmm. those three groups. So I'm going to be going with six, five other classmates from the Naval Academy. We were packed into an apartment in Imperial Beach, three, be <laughs> three bedrooms, <laughs> two to a room, like $200 per person a month Jack. for rent. And there was no way I could come back to that apartment having quit. Uh -huh. No way. How could I, how could I do that? So you're putting yourself in a situation. Did any of your 16 quit? One, Damn. not in, not in my group, Yeah, but you're putting yourself in a situation where external factors, you know, peer relationships, this kind of thing can actually, it, although it could be conceived mm -hmm. or construed as adding pressure, I think it actually made me, you know, it, it, at these kind of, you're at your breaking point point moments, this was maybe just a subliminal nudge in the direction of yeah. do not do not succumb, do not quit, push through, let's go. I was like so detached from people quitting. I didn't even understand what was happening. Like people were just quitting. I was like, I, I was saying this the other day, like they didn't seem like human to me. Like 
I, I, they didn't seem like a human, like, oh, this guy, I didn't, I didn't picture a person with like hopes and dreams and they, I can't believe they just did that and they, they joined the Navy and now they're quitting, like, oh gosh, what, I, I was just like, oh, this person's just a non-human thing that just like is moving on and they're not part of our, what we're doing. And it, so I wasn't even, I can't even name, I can only name one guy that quit and he was my boat crew leader and he was my boat crew leader in Hell Week, but that's the only, everyone else was just like, pfft, gone. I just never even thought about him, never even, and I never had thoughts like, oh, I, you know, this guy's my friend, so I never even thought like that. I was like, oh, we're just, gonna, I'm, we're just doing this. Oh, what do you want us to climb those rocks? You want us to jump in the water, whatever. Like, like I was, like you said, oh, maybe, you mentioned real quick, I said, well, you know, I, I'd have to go through all that stuff in the Naval Academy, like, yeah, maybe you're smarter, and I was like, no. In my mind, I was like, thinking, no, I was dumb. I was just like, oh, I'm going in the Navy, I wanna be a SEAL, they tell me to do something, I'm gonna do it. Like, yeah. that was my attitude. So, so, and it might have been beneficial. It seems yeah. like it was beneficial, but it also disconnected me from even really any recognition of how hard SEAL training is, because to me, I was like, there was just two groups of people me and my buddies and everyone else. And mm -hmm. we didn't know them and they just mm -hmm. went away and then we were all going to the teams. It was like, oh, who yeah, we're going to the teams. So it was almost yeah. like this weird, like now when I hear some of the statistics and you know more about it and and you know that guys that are, went to the Naval Academy and guys that were, you know, uh, uh, freaking division one swimmers and division mm -hmm. one wrestlers and division one football players and they all quit. Mm -hmm. And like that just didn't even, Mm. I, I, I just thought there were a bunch of guys that were just didn't mm. want to be here, and I do. Mm. So that mm. was that. Kind of crazy. Yeah, I remember someone giving me advice, or I collected along the way, three pieces of advice. Number one, in Hell Week, eat like it's your job. <laughs> Don't ever let a eat, no matter how tired you are, eat, eat, eat. Uh, second was give 70% effort 100% of the time. Try not to have to ever give 100%, <laughs> but a good 70% effort 100% of the time, sustainable. And then third was don't get close to anybody because yeah. you don't know if they're gonna quit. I'm wondering if when your boat crew leader quit, if that affected you. Uh -huh. I hear I hear when an officer, it sounds like it didn't, but I you hear stories about when an officer quits, three or four people go with that person. Yeah, I forget what get my buddy Giff, who I went through Hell Week, we, we, he was on here the other day and we were talking about it. He, he just said, like, he was laughing. He's like, you just looked at him like, all right, whatever. And we just like carried on. I was like, yeah, no factor. I was too like, I was too crazy, I guess. I was too just weird, I guess, or crazy or something. Uh, did you have any challenges during BUDS? Like when you got to pool comp, how was that? Did you have any challenges with the, with the five and a half nautical mile swim or anything like that? You know, I think what I saw in buds with my class was no matter how gifted a person was, there was probably going to be something at some point that was going to challenge them. And uh, one of the one of my classmates, this individual from the Naval Academy who I had known for four years at this point, was just a uh, just a stud in buds. And there was one day at the very end, for whatever reason, the the obstacle course rope with the uh, the the low wall, the one the you have wall. the high the wall, high you, wall. you yeah. ascend the rope and then kind of roll over. The rope was wet, and he just had a really hard time. I hope. <laughs> I hope I'm not, if he's listening, I hope he's, I'm not bringing up some bad memories. <laughs> Give but it a PTSD. Yeah, for me, you know, I actually did quite well in pool week. I, I maybe haven't gone to dive school yeah, really dive helped school me. Yeah, had to have had helped Had to have helped me. And I, I remember in dive school, the first, just feeling really uncomfortable breathing underwater. It just was weird, you know. But by the time second phase, dive phase of buds comes around, that was normal. That The, uh, the double hose regulator was new because we, we were using a single hose in dive school, oh, but dude. yeah, you know, and, and the, the aqua lung aqua master. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just, there was one evolution though. And it's, it's life saving. Uh, I forget if that was pre or post hell week. I want to say it was pre hell week, I but I think it's pre we had some large instructors <laughs> who had weight belts on and oh, yeah, they, bring it. <laughs> they bring it in. I failed the first time. Did it your was, world come crashing down? Yeah, I, it was just, he was just taking me under and, and the, the second time I failed and it was like the third time it's, oh, I'm thinking, you know, I'm sitting in the, like that wall, that line the of, wall shame, of shame, yeah, Ooh. where you Ooh. failed and now you, you have to, this is your chance, you know, I'm thinking like, am, is this it? So I, uh, I just really tried to focus on 
the procedure and trying to do it. And number one, like what I was failing was the fact that this instructor was underwater. So I like number one thing is keep this person's head above the water. I don't care if I'm drinking water, if I'm underwater the whole time, his head needs to be above the water Mm -hmm. the entire time. And uh, I get to the wall and it was a pass. (laughs) It was just like, we'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I hope I didn't come across like buds was easy for me. Cause I mean, I failed to run, I failed to swim, uh, I failed pool comp, and actually, here's the funny thing: for life saving, I got so ready for life saving, I was going, I was like hostile. I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight some dudes, and it was like that back then. I don't know if it was like that when you went through. It sounds like it was. It was a fight. Like you're gonna fight this person, and so I was super amped up for that. I went out, got first in line, and then in pool comp, I failed pool comp on Friday. And and over the weekend, me and my buddy, who's now an active duty master chief, <laughs> we he failed too, and we spent. I don't know how we did this. I don't know how this was legal. I don't know if it was legal. We spent the weekend in the dip tank with with t- charged twin innies. I don't know how we got them, and we just freaking pool comped each other in four, three, four feet of water. Like we're standing outside the dip tank. I'm in the dip tank. He's standing there just <laughs> ripping my face, and we did that for the whole weekend. The whole weekend we did that. I got on, on on Monday morning, I went in there, the instructor came down, and this instructor ended up being an admiral, but he came down, and as soon as I saw him coming down, I ripped off my own face mask and spit out my mouthpiece, <laughs> like, can bring it, dude. And he, sure enough, he was like, dude, this guy's obviously very confident, and he, you know, he messed me up, but then he was just like, you know, passed, so uh, I kinda would go a little bit extra on some of these things, <laughs> but, but I don't wanna make it sound like, uh, it was easy for me because, like I said, it, in fact, I failed to run. I failed to swim. Not only that, I can promise you, I never won a run. I never won a swim. I never won an O course. Mm-hmm. I was like in the middle of everything, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that was about that was about all I had too. Like yeah. when I failed to run, it was because I didn't. I tried to pace myself a little bit, and I failed. So my only way to pass a run was to run as hard so, as I possibly could the entire time. 100%. Yeah, effort. not not 70%, 100%. No, it was 100%, 100%. That's how I had to do it <laughs> yeah. to pass a run, to pass a swim, to pass everything. Uh, so your only big challenge, though, was life-saving. Life-saving, but there was a moment in the beginning stages of Hell Week where, and I can tell the story, I was at a, a decision point at my, I, I would say my breaking point. It, and a lot of this was because what of got you frustration. There? Oh, dude, they're gonna get you somehow. Frustration bro. with physical pain can be a really potent combination. And Hell Week, you know, starts on a, on a Sunday. You know it's gonna end Friday. You're gonna not sleep once until sometime on Wednesday. All these thoughts are kind of going through my head. 70% of my class, 80% are gonna quit. They're not gonna make it. Am I gonna be one of the ones who gets through? All these, looking around, you're in an isolation room (laughs) waiting for this thing to start. Just all these thoughts going through your head. You know what I was thinking at that time? Just like, oh, uh, 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 when's this going to start? I want pizza. <laughs> so you're having all these I'm advanced just, thoughts, just, dude. I'm yeah. having like just nothing. I'm like a freaking idiot. You know, I'm thinking all this stuff and, uh, you know, don't who knows who's going to quit? Don't get close to anybody. And we break out and it's just chaos and form up the longest mile. You go all the way down with the boats on your head to the bottom end of the Silver Strand racing. You're tired. It's It's not... It's not comfortable by any means, but uh, you know, at this point, it's like we're in. I'm in this. I mean, you're you're in it. You're in it, and so all that anxiety and buildup and apprehension has kind of dissipated because I'm just in this now. But we're forming up for the second race. This part of the longest mile, with the logs. Logs are you know the sectioned telephone poles, and my team steps up to a government pickup truck, so we're receiving our log, and uh, this thing was just insanely heavy. I don't know what was going on with it. It wasn't old misery. Mm -hmm. I don't know what was going on. It felt like it was waterlogged. Yep, it probably could have been waterlogged. And maybe the instructors knew, maybe they didn't. I don't know. They knew. (laughs) (laughs) And immediately, I just remember, we had one of the guys in the boat, and I guarantee you every single person under that log remembers this log. It was just so heavy. I mean, and you know what a log is supposed to weigh. You've done this stuff before and immediately groaned. And there was a guy on the boat team who had been through 
I think three days of hell week before and a pre, you know, two years before gone mm-hmm. to the fleet, come back and immediately was saying, <laughs> this log is a career ender. <laughs> you know, just <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is not good. So we, we received the, the brief, you know, log carry north, bust them, go. The race is on. And just all the teams in the class were just out of sight. You couldn't hear or see the second to last place team even. You know, this is bad. This is, wait, so you guys are so far <laughs> so far the back to you last can't place can't team. even see the second to last place team. I mean, yeah. like every, the whole class is just gone. Yeah. And we are all by ourselves at the last place so of course the instructors descended upon us like a pack of wolves you know Mm -hmm. with their megaphones and hurry up step it out move it out let's go and then there was this instructor in my face and this person had a unique ability to really get under my nerves and he's telling me he's going to kick me out of the program we need to step it out i'm at the far left end of the log are you the boat crew leader yes far left end of the log where the weight tends to collect and the person to my right, it just ten, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes into this race. I have no conception of time, but we're into this race now. We're in last place, and it seemed like his arms, there just wasn't much. So you can feel the increase of the weight. And I'm at the far left end of the log, so it felt like I was carrying two people's worth of weight on the far left end of this log that was so heavy. <laughs> I mean, it felt, it literally felt like my arms were going to just rip my rip out of the shoulder sockets. My biceps were totally on fire. I mean, every step was just horrendous. And I started just succumbing to self-doubt, frustration, thinking long-term thought, like, how am I going to, this is, I'm just a few hours into hell week. How am I going to make it like to Friday? Friday seems impossibly far away. And you know, this log is destroying my body. This is not good. It's not good. I worked years to get to this point, and you know, things are just unraveling fast. This is not a good start to hell. We're only a few hours in, middle of the night. And uh, there was this moment where I remember looking up into the sky as we're struggling to advance this log forward through the soft sand in last place and just thinking, I can't, I can't do this. This is just too much. And I was frustrated because these instructors and they don't, you know, I just wanted to scream that this isn't fair. This is, this is not, this log is not the right kind of weight. It's not a fair race, but I couldn't say that. And they didn't know or let on to their knowledge that this log was too heavy. So at this critical point where I, I just out of frustration, I was just about to walk away. I remember I just had this idea of like playing this game and it's all in my mind, but I could quit. But first, you know, take a few more steps. I take those steps, but then, okay, you can just keep playing this game, okay? Take a few more steps. Okay, I've done that. Let's just keep playing this game. And so I just got in that rhythm. And then I start, you know, yelling some encouragement to the team and, and let's go, let's go, let's go. And they probably wanted me to shut up. But this game, I learned a lesson like, okay, you got to, when you have these situations that push you to your limit, you may have long-term goals. You know, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL and all that, but it seemed like really far away. And as I un, you know, think about this and unpack this experience, what I have learned is that a way to get your mind away from these long-term thoughts that can only be discouraging is to just focus on mechanics and procedure and process, support the log with my arms, advance it with my team one step at a time. That's all I need to be thinking about, right? You know, and just, you learn that. I learned that in that night, right then and there in that race. And yeah, of course we finished last place and we got hammered, (laughs) but because, you know, it pays to be a winner and they want to drive home this lesson that losing in combat has severe consequences. You need to find ways to win. There was no way in hell we were going to win under this log, but that punishment occurred. The log was a way we were just, uh, I don't know, doing air squats or bear, cr- whatever it was, it was better than being under that log. And I knew that I just got through that. There was nothing, nothing this week that can be that bad. And nothing was that bad. And I remember laying in the surf zone, surf torture sessions. All I would need to do was just think, man, this is rest. (laughs) At least I'm not under that log. My whole perspective, it changed. I got through it. I learned that lesson, you know, just focus on one step at a time and advancing it in one, one, one. But uh, this, I think every person who gets through hell week at some form, whether they 
process this consciously or not, but you have to break down long-term massive challenges into increments, things that you can do right now that add up over time to get through a very difficult situation. That lesson was very valuable for me. No, that's a, that's a good one. And like I said, from my perspective, it was just like, mm, I never even was thinking that far in advance. I was like, <laughs> what, carry this log? Cool, got it. You know, I was too, uh, too much of a knuckle dragger to, to process these kind, of, uh, these kind of big picture strategic thoughts about my life. Yeah, you know, maybe I'm prone to <laughs> overthinking. And so there is something to be said for just just doing it yeah. and not think, you know, just do what you got to do. You know, I remember thinking when I was in hell week, I was like, oh, it's going to feel so good to, to go to sleep. Like it, it was almost like my anticipation. I was like, oh, it's going to feel so, so cool to stay awake for so long. Cause imagine how good it's going to feel to fall asleep when in a week, that's going to be so cool. It's going to feel so good to just like lay down. And I was kind of excited about the prospect of having stayed awake for so long, but then I got to go to sleep. And the only way you can get to, f to get that, much pleasure in sleeping <laughs> is to stay awake for that long. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just kind of a pain to go to sleep. It's like a waste of time. It yep. feels like it's like uh, bad. Um, so thankfully, you made it through. How many people started in your buds class? Do you remember? Oh, we had, when we classed up, I believe it was 196. That number sticks in my mind. It mm -hmm. seems like a pretty uh, a what precise class number. Were you? What class, were you? class 242. So June of 2002, we classed up. Hell week was late August. 2002 summer hell week mm -hmm. so the surf torture sessions weren't that bad they just leave you in longer yeah. but again it's just rest they adjust yeah <laughs> and uh i believe we graduated 26 original but we had rollbacks yeah. along the way yeah uh you get done so that's those were your major challenges a little bit of life saving two big challenges week. yeah um you get done and you get assigned to a team what team you end up going to west coast team team one so you end up going to Team One. Did you want to go to the West Coast? Yeah, I chose that. I had you had that Coronado on your mind. Yeah, you know, being from Kansas, I'd been East Coast at the Naval Academy, and you know, I. The thing is, when you get to a team, nobody cares that you went through Hell Week. Yep. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that you have a Trident. These things I've been working for for years, they no longer matter. Did you get your Trident after SQT? Yes. So, so September 2003, I reported the, that West Coast team in October 2003 as a new guy. So you show up and you get put right into a platoon? No. The policy at that team at that time was, and, and they were, the detailing was a little off in the sense that they were just a few months away and ended up doing a surge deployment. So... To I, the, the team had to do a surge deployment to Iraq. I think I kind of forget the particulars, but maybe more platoons were needed. I've, Is this an 04? Yes. And you were at Team One. Yes. And you went on deployment. Yes. Uh, in less the, than four months after arriving, you went on deployment in the what? What time of year? In Jan the January 04, I believe there was some kind of a surge happening within the community. Jack. And so I got to that team. They were already well through their workup. Mm -hmm. And so the policy, there were several of us junior officers who were just kind of floating around. Mm -hmm. And uh, the policy was not to put the third officer in a platoon at, at that team at that time. So, so did you go on deployment? Yeah, I did. I go? deployed to the Pacific. And, okay. Uh, got to I was at team seven. And yep. team one relieved us. So that's why. Yep. So I, if you would have gone to Iraq, you would have high fived with me in Iraq yeah. as I was getting ready to head home. I was not in that group. I was, I was bummed. You know, when you think at the Naval Academy that you've now been selected to go to BUDS, 9-11 just happened. This is for real. We're going to war. You go through BUDS, Hell Week, et cetera, land warfare, everything, SQT. You get to a team. You're deploying to war. I did not realize that some platoons deploy to non-combat environments even when there is combat yeah. going on. And that was a surprise to me. Not exactly what I expected, but I'm a new guy, and so you just you go where you're told. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people may not realize this, but platoons don't often get to control where they deploy, or even the commanding officer of the team doesn't yeah. get to control that. There's a... There's a 
strong element of chance in all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And you have that's why the best thing you can do is get to a team, do a good job, do the best you can, keep going on deployment, and mm-hmm. hopefully you get in the right place at the right time. The better you do, the better reputation you have, the better chance you will have, but it's still only a chance. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, did you do a full six months in the Pacific? It was nine months. Oh, dang. Nine months in the Pacific staged uh, at a Guam, doing a lot of exercises with various countries. I mean, you got to, we got to do some cool training, which for me was actually new training, mm-hmm. uh, especially in terms of uh, urban combat and movement through houses and uh, among structures. So that was something I hadn't been exposed to because I hadn't done the workup. Mm-hmm. So getting to do that with a platoon with sim munition and this kind of thing was was really good training, I thought. So you get done with that deployment, now you get put as an assistant platoon yeah, com- correct. commander? Yes, so And this, you're still at team one? Yeah, so this is now 2004, gonna be deploying 2005. Assistant platoon commander, same team. And how's this? Yep, it, uh, assistant platoon commander, I'm still a new guy. You know, you're in this position as a junior officer in my situation, not being prior enlisted like you were, that, you're in terms of not only age but experience in the teams you're just outranked even though maybe technically on the uniform there's a rank so it's a difficult position to navigate sometimes i think you want to go into this with some humility with asking questions i found that junior officers in the team sometimes and i I think I'm, I can put myself in this category, try to cover up some of their insecurities, not knowing things, not having the experience by acting as if they do know. Yeah, and, which and is a big mistake. That's in, in, I, yeah, in retrospect, you can, you can see, you know that people can see through this, but at the time you don't necessarily realize that. And so maybe you're reluctant to ask advice or ask someone's opinion, but I actually learned that this is a wonderful opportunity to show someone that you value their opinion. You ask, hey, in, in the in the locker room in, where the cages are, how are you setting up your kit? Just pick their brain. And I mean, this is a, I think this is a good, a good thing for anybody in any organization when you're new is just ask the people who know what's going on, what do you recommend? And this, this creates a sense of uh, buy-in, I think, the, the the fact that you value their opinion, that's that's useful. So I tried I tried to approach it from a position of humility, but as an assistant platoon commander, your primary responsibilities are to learn tactics, learn small unit leadership, and then do administrative functions for the platoon and support the platoon commander. Yeah, and I mean, even though I was a prior enlisted guy, I mean, I still would ask the team like the the guys hey what do you how do you think we should do this what do you think we should do how, wh- where should we insert what do you think about this platform over here i would always do that even if even when i was the more experienced and sometimes even the most experienced and i learned that from one of my platoon commanders who was a prior enlisted guy who had more experience than any of us who asked us hey what do you think how do you think we should do this and that's you know i got to just steal his leadership uh techniques for when i be for when i was put in charge but i always give that advice you know if you there's no sense in acting like you know what you're doing because everybody not only do they see through it but they don't expect you to know everything they're like hey you've been here for three months bro we don't expect you to know how to run this drill or how to plan for this mission it's okay we, we, we do and we can all work together to figure this out uh any standout memories from that workup getting ready to deploy you know my memories are of the people and in particular two who are no longer here and, th- and that's just uh, something that I'll uh, always take away from that platoon. Uh, one, w- one was uh, killed in, in the extortion mm-hmm. uh, helicopter crash and another on an operation uh, a few years ago. So that's, that's tough. I, you know, I, I really just, I think about those guys a lot. I, I would say one of my leadership failures in this phase was along the lines of being in that position of you're younger, you don't have as much experience, you're falling into wanting to be one of the one of the guys, one of the you know buddies, and 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 I I would say you know 
this is probably something that everybody deals with in in the junior officer ranks of the teams. You want to be liked. You want to be buddies. You know, going out and this kind of thing with the guys. And I, you know, I did that, and and I don't have any regrets. But I think for me, one of the hardest, I think, I, I, hardest positions I could have put myself was to be able to make a decision that's that may be right, but not popular. Now I wasn't the platoon commander, but as an AOIC, it's pretty easy to get into that situation of like, okay, you're supposed to support the platoon commander, but yet you are buddies with the guys. It can be sort of like in a, between a rock and a hard place kind of a situation. I think that was a leadership takeaway that I had from that, that platoon. And we ended up deploying to the Pacific again. This was uh, more uh, s- directly located in one specific a- AO. And it was doing foreign internal defense with host nation forces. And we were dispersed kind of in a satellite model. And uh, it was a long deployment. There's definitely some leadership challenges. Guys in the platoon, they want to go to Iraq. They want to go to Afghanistan at this point. But we're, we're on this deployment to the, to the Pacific theater. And, and so, yeah, there, there's some leadership challenges for sure in that environment. Yeah, and for a while, the SEAL teams was rotating like so you do half your deployment in the Pacific and then go into Iraq or Afghanistan for another three months But eventually people said that's not a good move either and it really isn't I mean it really it just doesn't make It's like the fair fairy Comes up with those kind of ideas because it's more fair to get mm-hmm. and, and you know you you feel you feel it You know you're like well this guy, these guys want to go get in the fight, so that seems like the fair thing to do, but unfortunately, it's the fair fairy doesn't always have the best ideas. Even though it seems fair, it's not smart. Yeah, and, and the argument is, well, you know, okay, th- six months is t- too long to be in combat so we can relief in place and the people who really want to go to, you know, but then <laughs> you're bringing in people that don't have AO expertise. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, I agree. I So... At this point now, I've done two deployments as a junior officer. I have not been to Iraq or Afghanistan. And people who I'd gone through buds with at this point have started deploying to Iraq or OEF in Afghanistan, and they're going on combat operations. You know, the stuff that we trained to do. We trained to do all of it, but the what really pushes your training in, in – the ultimate test of your training applied overseas is what you could be doing in Iraq, given the state of things at that time was what you could be doing in Iraq or Afghanistan. And so, yeah, I was feeling, to be honest, uh, a bit frustrated because as a junior officer, you're going to get your AOIC deployment, your OIC deployment in platoons. Mm -hmm. And if you're either in a platoon or you're not, and I've, when I first showed up at the team and I'm not in a platoon, that sucks. <laughs> it sucks. You're in a platoon or you're not, and you're going to get two platoons and then maybe a task unit commander tour, but okay, certainly not as quite as operational. So yeah, I'm like, man, I got one more to go. And yeah, I was, I was a little bit frustrated to be honest. And then now I've and I don't, I don't want to come across as bitter. I'm just trying to be honest about how I felt yeah, at yeah. the time. Well, what kind of human beings try and go through all this shit to go to the SEAL teams? Guys that want to go to war. So when you do a nine-month deployment with no war, and then you, now you go on a six-month deployment, no war, and you know you've got limited opportunities in the rest of your career, it's going to be – I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want – the type of person that's like, oh, I was happy I wasn't going to war. Like, that's not the kind of guy you would want in the SEAL teams. Right. I talk to firefighters, and I talk to them, and it's not that you're necessarily necessarily wanting there to be fire, people's lives to be at risk, but given that there is one, you want to be the one who responds. And if you're not around people that feel that way, that's that's a problem. And I was proud to be around a group of people that, by and large, want to go respond to that fire, so to speak, in the teams. Yeah, and I think they eventually got to a point where, like, hey, if a guy had just gone to Iraq or Afghanistan and maybe he'd gone twice in a row and now they put him in a platoon where he's not going to go, and it was a little – it did get more fair 
as time went on, but this was only what? This was 2005, so it was like, you know, it's a tough one. Yeah, I come back from that deployment in 2006, and then I did a little bit of an overseas augmentation in Afghanistan, and I, I did get to go there, got to see some of the, the country, some of the area of operations. I came back from that, and then I did what's called a disassociated tour. So you're not in a platoon, and again, in my estimation, you're either in a platoon or you're not. And if you're one of the people who's not, it's a distinct feeling. <laughs> There's nothing like being in a platoon. It's no. one of the best. I mean, I would do that job for 20 years well, if I course. could. Uh, but so I, I'm a disassociated to her, but supporting platoons at the team on a deployment that. So you did another deployment, another deployment. And we, but at least you, so you've been to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and now you come back, you're doing a disassociated tour of some job where you're supporting the teams, mm -hmm. where you're doing some kind of like re recon it's element in, type it, thing? Ge generally Intel. speaking, yeah, intelligence collection and this kind of thing. So work, it, it was definitely a leadership, you know, I'm I'm a officer in charge. Right, and you're in charge of operational yeah. stuff that's gonna help. Yeah, absolutely. Where did you deploy to? To Iraq. Okay, Yeah. so that's and, also nice. Yeah, and I got to see the area. Uh, I did get to go out on some operations, but again, I'm not in the platoon. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was, it's just, you know, you can chalk it up to experience, but again, I, I just can't help but think, okay, I, I don't have combat experience. And you know, this combat experience is the mark of respect in the teams. Now I'm, that deployment goes to 2008. I've been in five years with a Trident six years into my career and I don't have combat experience and it's not my fault, but this is something I felt like I had been training for and uh, I just felt insecure about it. Where were you when you were in Iraq? Where'd you go? We were in the, the Western provinces there. Yeah, so near where you were in, in Ramadi and, uh, and we had various, I think it was more like an outstation model at this point. Did you at least go like on some ops? Oh yeah, some yeah, 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 but oh. no shots fired. I mean, I don't consider that combat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Not that, not that, uh, I mean, some you know, good operation, there may no, there may not be shots fired. It's just, I didn't have, and, and I wasn't in a leadership position yeah. tactically, yeah. so. Okay, so you come back from that deployment. Yes. So now you're one, two, three, three deployments deep. Yep, in an augmentation, and oh, I, I. How long was that augment it to was Afghanistan? Two, two months. Yep. Okay, and I and I got to do I got to go to an outstation there, and that was that was great. But I'm now past my service requirement. I could get out. You know, yet after a, a graduating from the Naval Academy, you do five years, you can punch. I'm like <laughs> that would just seem like so weak yeah. to me. Uh, you know, I, I honestly I didn't even think about that right. to be honest. But as I look back, I'm like, wow, yeah, I could have after that deployment, I could have just gotten out. And then, you know, things would have been different. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really hard, uh, like you like like we're talking about, it's really hard to look at your career and be like, okay, I'm just gonna get out now. When you know you got friends that are fighting, you know that you have more to offer. So you're not getting out. No, and right? the one <laughs> the one job that I have to do is platoon commander. Right. I mean, if in my opinion, if you don't do that, that's for me, where I was in my mind. I don't do that job. I'm failing myself and everything that I've been through. That's the one critical tour that I'm going to do. Right. And so you go back to team one to do that? Yeah. So you get back to team one. Now you're a platoon commander. Correct. And this is now, you know, I had been an officer in charge of the, the previous uh, element, but for me, this was a very special assignment. And I really was excited just to be a platoon leader in a SEAL platoon, just felt like seven, eight, nine years of effort is like coming down to this, this two year assignment. And you actually have some decent experience for being a platoon commander. I mean, you've done multiple deployments overseas. Uh, you, you, you're doing all right. This isn't like a guy that, like sometimes you get a lateral transfer that has like what they did. Mm. Sometimes they do no deployments. Sometimes a lateral transfer is really senior and they just get put into an OIC position. They have no experience. Mm -hmm. So you've been in the teams the whole time and you know, you've done multiple deployments. Mm -hmm. So you're feeling, you must have been feeling pretty good about being a platoon commander. Oh, absolutely. And I, I volunteered, I I'm the 
person who's going to volunteer, volunteer to go do the augmentation. I didn't need to do that. And that was after a deployment. You know, I pretty quickly after I wanted to go, I wanted to get the experience. Mm-hmm. But you go through an 18 month platoon workup cycle and, uh, and your, your deployment is where your deployment is. And you only, you know, so six years may seem like a long time, but it's actually not a lot of different assignments. It's only three assignments really within that time. And what's going on with your family this whole time? Like you've been gone or what's, what's happening with the, with the family. So at this point it's, it's just my mom and sister. My sister now is, she's in college in Kansas. My mother remarried after my father died in 1999 when I was at the Naval Academy. And also we, how, how do we, uh, we skipped over that What What happened to your dad yeah. when you were at the Naval Academy? Well, he was out on a bike ride one day and was hit by a car, and this just happened uh, out of the blue. I had been training for the triathlon team, and I think he had kind of taken up cycling. But it was one of these mornings at the Naval Academy. I was just getting ready to go to class, and (laughs) I remember one of the upperclassmen came by, and I'm a sophomore at this point, and it's pretty – or I had just been home in Kansas because over the summer Mm – and he said, oh, the company officer wants you, wants to see you. Oh, what did I do? Or, you know, there's probably, I, I'm sure there was something I had done in the recent memory that would, would lead me to believe like, oh man, I got caught. So I go in there and he told me the news and it just was like the floor dropped out from under me. We had a, a the company senior enlisted was a Marine Corps gunnery sergeant and he was, he knew he had met my father because at the end of plebe summer, you, the parents get to come and see how things were, you know, you've graduated plebe summer. And so they would talk about the Marine Corps and, and this gunny was awesome. And he, he, he was uh, very supportive. I got, this happened on a Thursday and the Naval Academy and all of its generosity told me you can go home on emergency leave. You need to be back Thursday, the following week, one week. That still pisses me off. But I went home, the funeral, and then came back and was in class a week later. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, so my mom ended up remarrying. I ended up being overseas when that happened. My sister is in nursing school mm-hmm. in at Kansas and I'm single, ready to deploy <laughs> and uh, ready to be a platoon commander in 2008. So you're, you're in a platoon and going through workup, this is probably when I met you for the first time, when you were going yes, through workup. you were training detachment OIC. Yeah, we have good times. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I first of all want to thank you for the training, specifically land warfare. You know, I didn't get to stay on that deployment very long, but I'm of the firm opinion that training should be very difficult, and I think you really stepped it up, and so that – Probably saved lives. Jason Gardner, who was was the, I guess he was the senior enlisted guy when you guys were out there when you got hit. But he 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 talks he's talked to me about it and like how everything went down and definitely you know his whole deployment. He has multiple stories where you know there was maneuver elements that they were able to act on and able to stop and blue on blues that could have easily happened that they didn't happen because they'd been through training that was really hard. So yeah, it was definitely, uh, my goal was to make the training hard so that guys were ready for combat. Um, and you know, it was, it was awesome to see. It was awesome to, for me to be able to watch guys develop and get really good and understand what their job was. It was a really steep learning curve, but it was also like a learning curve that was steep, but also had like really nice steps on it where you'd, Mm -hmm. you know, this training operation, you'd learn this thing and then they'd figure this other thing out and then they'd do this other thing. We'd put them in a different scenario and, and then you've got them in mount and they're learning, you know, other steps. So by the time guys were getting done, they were really, really competent leaders Mm. and it was awesome to see. I remember you, you broke things down in a way that made sense in, in its simplicity. I remember one time you were, I think, I don't know if we were one-on-one, but it was a very close conversation. And you were just saying, listen, either you're online or you're in an L. <laughs> I, I just, I, I think it was one-on-one. And it just, the way you said it, it just really 
hit home. You know, yeah, okay. And then I, I fouled it away. And that, that was a very valuable uh, lesson for me. And it, it's a simple one. It's, it's pretty simple. But sometimes, you know, in the chaos, you just – you, you just get overwhelmed, and so, and then, and then, just to to prioritize and execute. That's a, no, a really important rule that uh, you know there could be. I, I can see situations in training environments or in combat where you're getting overwhelmed by either too much going on, or you're you're actually overwhelmed because there's there's actually no seemingly viable course of action. Mm-hmm. I think those are two different situations, but in the the other, the one where there's just so much going on, okay, you know, prioritize and execute and, and pick the most important thing or either delegate it or act upon it yourself. With the other situation, uh, you know, there's, it just doesn't seem like there's any viable course of action. What can we even do to make this situation better? Just realize there's always something you can do. Oh, you're never out of the fight. Even if you're going to continue doing what you're currently doing, that's an active choice, not a passive Mm -hmm. choice and there's a difference there oh yeah there's a big difference uh as you're going through that workup how was like the relationships with your with your platoon chief with your lpo did you guys have a good solid you know uh platoon from your perspective yeah we did and and i think i think that's why our platoon task unit was selected to go to afghanistan because i think we did well and when I say that platoons and tasking don't always get to choose where they deploy, but there is a little bit of a selection process mm-hmm. going on within the team. And so I think I took it as a, a compliment that we're going to go on this deployment to Afghanistan. And and the West Coast teams had not been deploying to that AO for a while. So it was, it was going to be new. It weren't going to be going to Iraq this time. And so we knew that the team, the platoons that we would be replacing were getting into it. Mm-hmm. My platoon chief was experienced. We had a prior enlisted assistant officer in charge who was really, really great. And, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to approach this position f- with in my mind was this leadership position was if through the workup I can ask the opinion of the enlisted members of the platoon and really show that I value their advice, that that is going to create a sense of empowerment and buy-in, but also that their their value is their, their opinion is valued and that can create an atmosphere of innovation because what you, you don't want to train fire team leaders to just be responsive to doing what they're told. You want them to have initiative. And so in order to do that, you know, this is a, Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? Just in the day to day. And, and I, I hope that that, you know, ult- the ultimate uh, barometer here is, is the opinion of the people in the platoon. But yeah, and the other the other thing is, when you're going through a platoon workup, you're 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 trying to train yourself, and you're trying to train everybody in their various job. But you also have to be training people to be able to step up, and that is one of the things. Going through a training evolution, you have training detachment instructors evaluating you on your own leadership and tactical decisions, but you need to be able to step aside and say, okay, hey, you got this one. Let's go. It's and it's. It's tough because you're, oh, are people going to think I'm just ducking it out because I don't want to make a bad call? But you do need to have the ability to do one job above you. And I think those two things were what I worked on. And I think especially the second one, (laughs) you know, giving assistant platoon commander the opportunity to take my position, that that in hindsight was the right call. Mm, For sure. Yeah, and we would would do that too. You know, if we had a a platoon commander or a platoon chief that was – really running everything they'd be the first person we put down in a training scenario just to let's see what's going to happen now Mm -hmm. now that we pulled this guy out um so you get done with this workup and and now it's time to go on deployment and like you said you had been selected to go to afghanistan and you end up going uh on the pdss right the pre-deployment site survey yes You know, we didn't go months in advance. So there was, as I recall, there was going out a few months early and then there was going out Mm -hmm. three weeks or so before your platoon. For whatever reason, we didn't go a few months. I I don't know why. But the plan was for some of the key leaders in the task unit to go early, three weeks or so early. That's standard procedure. I remember thinking, you know, this is – 
this is just is what you do. This is a very important deployment for me given, and I remember thinking, uh, you know, if I was only going to get one, if you can only have one really good deployment, well, this is the one I would choose. So it just kind of felt like things are lining up. Yeah, and going into that deployment, like I said, it was Jason Gardner and his task unit, uh, task unit Trident, and they had, you know, Jason describes that as the most kinetic of his deployments, and he'd done a lot, a lot of deployments. And so those guys were, and, you know, I was tracking those guys. I remember I said uh, I would sign my emails back and forth when they would tell me what they were doing. I would sign my emails to them, uh, you know, Jocko, spiritual advisor to task unit, <laughs> try to, they got a kick out of that, him and the task unit commander and stuff. Uh, but, you know, we were tracking, they were doing a lot of really kinetic operations and yeah, definitely for the guys on the West Coast getting ready to go there at that time, that's uh, a good place to be going because, you know, uh, Iraq had settled down a lot at this point, you know, kind of after the, the, the uh, debt defender group going into Sadr City, you know, Iraq had definitely settled down. So you guys were going to the, you know, the best show in town. Yeah, and I felt we were ready. Land warfare in the desert of California is pretty similar to the terrain and the geography of uh, southern Afghanistan. And we had a hard land warfare training block we dialed in our training specifically over the uh you know post workup phase where you can kind of you know we're going to deploy and we're doing a lot of uh, operations in training that we're going to mimic we're mimicking what we felt we're reading in the after action reports we knew these guys were getting into and we knew specifically how they were going in the operations so we could tailor the training for that and we had done all that so we were we were ready we're Mm -hmm. ready to go so you show up on the ground how long are you on the ground for before and when you hit the ground are they like hey we got one in the hopper right now we're gonna rock and roll yeah so some operations are time sensitive this is one that was not it was shelved and i think they wanted to you know and and rightly so they wanted to expose us to a not only the execution of the operation but the planning process the relevant players sit in on the briefing and all of this is very valuable who we're going to talk to the air crew and and all of that. So yeah, they had one w- ready for us for the leadership element that had gone early. And keeping in mind, most of the platoon and tasking is still back in San Diego at this point. So as soon as you show up on the ground, are they like, all right, here's here's what we got in the books. We're gonna how 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 long was it before you be, from the time you got on the ground? <laughs> do they hand you like, hey, come, let's give you a brief, a general brief of what's happening. Let's let us give you a concept of operations of what we're about to go do. Yeah, and I, th- I think. This is where my memory gets a little fuzzy, I think, just given what ended up happening. I, I feel like I was on the ground, well, certainly no more than 48 hours. Yep. Yeah. So you show up, you're getting a brief. How many guys from your task unit are there? It's like three or four? I'd say six to eight. Six to eight. Yeah. And you guys all have, you get assigned probably jobs with you know, the different sections or the different squads that they have. I was assigned to the platoon leader from one of the two platoons in country who you know from your task unit. Yep, yep. Yep. And so we just go through, I I remember they were planning, but in the final stages. And then I remember sitting on the brief. I remember going to the plywood huts, kidding up. I remember going to the flight line, taking the trucks to the flight line. And are you thinking this time, hey, you have a good understanding of the operation, you know what we're going to yeah. do, you're going to get a good feel for yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, don't let my <laughs> my absence of memory right now and the details of where it happened mm-hmm. uh, affect the impression that I, I I just think given what happened and, and I don't remember yeah. where this happened. I don't remember the – I remember the generalities of the operation, of course, but I, I the details escape me. What do you remember? I remember being in Canada. I remember going for a run. I remember going for a lift. I remember eating. I remember sitting in the briefing. I remember going to the plywood hut. I remember sleeping one night. I remember going to the fire pits before we launched for a chaplain led ceremony, a ritual. You know, this is, this is, I think, 
evident of combat. You can, it's like you have bits and pieces of memory Mm -hmm. facts and they can get assembled in different ways. And certainly when I talk about the operation and what happened in order to get the complete picture, you'd have to talk to other people. My impression is my own impression. And I fully acknowledge that my memory may be distorted, Mm -hmm. but there are absolutely parts of this that I completely remember. And what is interesting to me though, is that some of this pre-operational occurrences that they, I just don't really remember a lot of it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know why. Do you remember being on the helos going in? Yes. I remember sitting on the helo, you know, it's, it's loud and you're on night vision goggles. No one's really talking. You could hear the pilot chatter if you want to be on that frequency. And yes, it was probably about a, 45 minute flight. I mean, the general operation was to conduct a target assault, a, a compound, a drug, a bazaar. Uh, I think at this time we were getting into the counter narcotics. Uh, you know, this is a funding source for Taliban and this is in heavily controlled Taliban territory. There's bad dudes in this place. This is it you know, Taliban controlled village and there's going to be an assault. I'm not in the assault force element, but I'm going to be in the blocking force. And so I'd be shadowing the element that was pre, pre-assault, detached from the main assault force. We would, uh, you know, after disembarking the helicopters, we'd foot patrol under cover of quiet and darkness, middle of the night. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and just going over the plan, you know, it, it was just to secure the top of a hill in the element that I was right, in. Right. And so you're going to provide yeah. kind of like an overwatch yeah, support absolutely. element yeah, for a, as an assault is going down. Yeah. And all this is going to happen. The assault was going to happen either right before or right at first light to have a little bit more visual clarity. I think that that's really what they wanted to do. So you remember the helos coming in. Yeah, I remember going to the flight line. I remember sitting on the helicopter. I remember the, getting off the helicopter. You know, they're departing. You wait for, you know, it's, it's quiet again. You start foot patrolling. It's kind of, uh, you know, offset. Mm-hmm. So going through, I remember walking. Th- everyone's, you know, on night vision goggles. So it's, I'm sure the technology has improved a lot, but back then it's green and black. And I remember, you know, the v- villages there look like they're from medieval times, just with the, the mud brick. Seeing that. It's very quiet. We're just moving. And then, uh, you know, the element that I was a part of detached from the main assault force to proceed to the, to that hill that overlooked the target compound. We were going to, we needed to clear and hold that hilltop. And there was from satellite imagery, we knew there was an uh, old fort up there from back when the Russians were in Afghanistan. So we needed to clear and hold that structure, but it was, it was very crumbled at this point and own the high ground. And, once we had done that, we could set up a commanding overwatch position with uh, you know, heavy weapons and this kind of thing. So foot patrolling, we had detached from the main assault force element, foot patrolling to that hill. It's going to be about a 15, 20 minute hike to get to the top of the hills. A fairly, it was not a mountain, but it was a large hill going single file, working their way up and uh, being led. We had a Navy explosive ordnance disposal technician up there. And he was sweeping the ground like, you know, as standard, but it was recognized that there's a strong possibility of improvised explosive devices. We'll have EOD up front and have everybody else covering behind. And as we're working our way up, I remember I was shadowing with the platoon commander and then we kind of had got our way up to the top and I just started moving forward and I've thought about this a lot. I certainly, you know, and I'll, I'll talk about it later, but you know, you can armchair quarterback everything. And I'm just detaching from who I was shadowing because it didn't seem at this point, I'm not being value added by just standing there. And so I was going to take part and moving forward. I was going step by step all of a sudden The next thing I know, I'm on the ground. I want to say there was a flash of light. I didn't hear anything. I was on the ground. I didn't know what had happened. Now, this is where the experiences of combat can be different from one person to another. And if I would, to get a complete picture, you'd have to talk to everybody that was up there. All I remember is waking up. 
coming to. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long I was out. I've talked to people on that operation who are down below. They said a massive mushroom cloud went off and that for a long time, nobody was responding on the radio and that they thought perhaps everybody up there was dead. All I remember is coming to, I was disoriented. It occurred to me, I must have stepped on a pressure plate. I remember that. And pressure plate below the ground, the bomb goes off. I didn't know what the bomb was, but it turns out, I'm told, two 105 millimeter artillery shells wired together. The second one didn't go off. The first one went off low order. So, I mean, this can destroy everybody up there, armored vehicle. But the second one didn't explode and yeah, low order. But I'm laying there and I just remember thinking I need my teammates. It didn't occur to me that they were dead, but I didn't know if they were alive. I just knew I needed them. And I remember reaching up for my push to talk. I remember I got to get man down out over the radio. And I reached up for where it should be, but it's not there. I was thinking, this is not good. And nothing on my kit, my kit is, nothing's where it's supposed to be. Only my arms seemed to work. I can't see anything. I think my helmet had been blasted off, night vision gone with it. I can't move. Only my arms are working. And I'm laying there. For a second, I just felt utterly helpless because I couldn't do anything. You want to you want to be doing something. I tried to find my push to talk. It's not there. In my memory, the next thing that happened, though, my teammates are on me. None of them had been injured. Bells rung, yes, but nobody incapacitated. We could not afford to have one other person incapacitated up there. Remote position, elevated. I mean, just not a good situation to even have one person down, but two really not i mean just if not impossible to deal with we had a medic up there of course navy explosive ordnance disposal is trying to just protect us at this point digging for other or sweeping and digging for other finding additional ieds i'm told up there there were several in fact we had been walking on them mm-hmm. none had gone off until i found one but the medic fortunately you know responded, it wasn't injured, responded as he was trained to do. Everybody responded as they were trained to do, selflessly, quickly, to try to save my life. And I remember him putting on a tourniquet. You know, we practice putting these on in training, but you don't ever really crank it down like you do when you need to, to say actually save someone's life and to actually cut off blood flow, a staunch blood flow. It's painful just cranking that thing down. I wasn't in pain from the blast. I was in shock. But I do remember the tourniquet getting cranked down. But that wasn't enough, so we applied another one and then another one and another one and another one. I'm told it was six total, just cranking each one of them down to try to stop the blood flow to my lower body. And then I'm told that there was just this scramble going on. Unbeknownst to me, this is happening, all external to my own inner world right now. But to get the helicopters that initially dropped us off, which according to the plan, we're gonna go back to Kandahar Airfield a 45 minute flight away, touch down refuel, unload an Army Special Forces team and some Afghan commando troops bringing these soldiers back to be a blocking force for when that target assault would commence. So the plan was already to bring the helicopters back, but this is now a major contingency that has to be responded to and time and fuel and everything is going to be of the essence. Now I'm only hearing this after the fact again, but it's going to be a race against the clock to try to get me out of there because time is of the essence. And so the guys up above, you know, they hadn't cleared the hilltop. So there's no way you can, can, land or hover a helicopter up there. I mean, it's, it's just too dangerous. So they got to get me down off this hill that we had taken, you know, it's 20 minutes plus to climb when we were good, not to mention now dragging someone. I, I, I seem to remember them carrying me and tripping and falling and I'm falling from a few feet in the air. And it just, in addition to being dis, 
damaging to my body. It just was slow. They needed to go to the the down man drag, shoulder straps of my kit, dragging me. And so this is where their their grit comes into play and their fitness and their desire to save my life and why I'm eternally grateful to my teammates because they were having to drag me down a steep, dark, rocky hilltop, switching off, dragging. And it's fatiguing to do that. Maybe one or two are going at a time and they're rotating out. The medic is attending to me. And I remember the just, I was probably in and out of consciousness, but I don't recall that. I just recall this just happening in, in real time and with no interruptions. This, and people have asked, did you think you were gonna die or anything? No, I didn't. I just didn't. There was no space in my mind, no capacity to think those thoughts because I was consumed, inundated by the pain, getting dragged over. It was sharp, craggy rocks. And this, I talk about the pain of six tourniquets getting applied or any physical pain of like doing a marathon or running a hell week race with a log or something. It's just, it doesn't compare to this. This was excruciating. And it was all I could do just to try to stay awake and stay awake and stay awake and stay awake. And I think that was my desire to live that if I could stay awake, that that is my struggle to live and to not succumb. And so that was what I was focused on. And whether my brain was saying that or not, that's what was happening. I wasn't thinking thoughts of you need to stay awake in order to live. It, it just was stay awake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, it's getting very close to the helicopters and their fuel, time fuel calculation, bingo fuel, all of this. You know, they're, if they hit bingo fuel, they're gone with or without me. And... I'm told that I got loaded onto the helicopter really, really close to the bingo fuel mark. So, I mean, there was a lot that had to line up for that to happen. And for me to get on that helicopter, I shook Nick's hand. I remember that. I absolutely remember that. He got off the back. They were going to continue with the operation. The tail ramp goes up. And then I remember there was a light in my face and then it was out. I don't remember anything mm -hmm. after that. Yeah, the um, you know, f working with Jason now, um, he's talked me through this this scenario uh, a bunch of times. That being said, I don't want to try and you know give his whole side of the story, um, but I mean, just a couple key points. If you think uh, you know a femoral bleed can kill you in a minute and a half, two minutes, and you had two of them wide open, and the guys were able to get in there and put enough tourniquets on to stop that and keep you alive, like that right there, the the how quickly they must have been done that is just a testament to the training and their determination to keep you alive. I know that there was uh, Jason talks about one of the seals that got on his hands and knees with the EOD guy with their bayonets to start probing for IEDs because they realized that the IEDs that were up there weren't magnetic, so the, the sweeper wasn't finding them. So these two guys are on their hands and knees probing for a path to get you guys out of there. And then you know the, the OIC is getting all this stuff coordinated. Um, and yet Jason usually, when he talks about this, he'll mention the fact that, and, and actually Leif and I wrote about this same OIC when he was Leif's AOIC, like calls me calls me on the radio in a situation. And he's like, hey, this is what we've got right now. We got down guys, we got a Iraqi killed. Like he's talking in a calm, cool, collected voice. And that's exactly what Jason said. This massive explosion happened. And Jason gives him a second and finally he wants to know what's going on. He says, hey, what was that? And that OIC, Calm, cool, and collected. Said uh, we've got a that was a big that was an IED. We've got a badly wounded guy. We're working through it at this time. And then like Jason just let him work. But um, yeah, the all the things that fell into place um, from your own mentality to like stay awake to the medics and other guys getting tourniquets on to guys on their hands and knees with literally with their bayonets to to try and find a way out of there and then the guys buddy carrying you and dragging you down i mean it's uh it's it's a miracle that you're sitting here um and the wounds were 
horrific. Uh, you know, it wasn't, it didn't stop at your legs, right? This blast like tore into your guts mm-hmm. and everything else and uh, just, just absolutely horrendous. And that's why, you know, some of the initial reports that we got back on the strand was, you know, is he gonna make it? I don't know. And like I said in the beginning, when you hear a team guy say, I don't know, that's a, that's a bad sign. Um, so the, yeah, the, the platoons and the task unit, they really did what they were supposed to do. They did what they were trained to do. They did what they planned to do, you know? And it's uh, a testament to our training and the determination of our guys and how much they care about each other and what they'll do to, to try and you know, save, their, save their friends. Yeah. I, for any of them listening, I, I really just appreciate it. It's all, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, you know, when you, you think, when I hear this, when I, anytime I hear an external account, such as what you're talking about, Jason saying happened, it's just, it's just a reminder to me how lucky I'm in to be alive. And I'll take life like this missing two legs any day over dying up on that hill any day. So the pilots as well. Yeah. Thank you. Doctors, medical professionals. I mean, every step along the way, people responded professionally, bravely. I remember before the deployment, we we're reading the after action reports and the task unit in country at the time, which we were going to be replacing. We're doing the turnover op with, they had in a situation where an Afghan soldier stepped on an IED as well, two legs, gone and uh as as bad as it may sound to say that that was practice and practice in real life saving Mm -hmm. in the field and i'm told that person later died of infection they were able to keep him alive in the field later died of infection in an afghan hospital because infection is a serious risk and that is another thing that i'm very thankful for getting dragged down that hill to not i mean through ages and ages worth of goat shit and dust to not have massive infections is a miracle. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm for many, many reasons. I'm very, very grateful for the fact that I'm here and that I have what I have. When did you wake up? I woke up about 10 days later, give or take a day. And I'm in what appears to be a hospital room with my mother's face about two feet away. And I can tell you, when you go to bed at night and you wake up in the morning, you have a general sense of the uh, progression of time relative to, say, taking a nap this afternoon when you wake up. When you are in a medically induced coma for about 10 days, you wake up and you don't have any sense of time progressing. My last memories were being dragged of a helicopter into a helicopter at night, being on foot patrol, being at the top of this mountain. You know, now I wake up and I'm just all of a sudden in a in a hospital with my mom's face right there. I had no like, how the hell did I get here? What the hell happened? Is what I'm thinking. What the hell happened? And so, could you talk immediately? Did you look at your mom? What, what was that? What was that oh, awakening I, like? The really one of the first things I said to her, she had been summoned from the basement of the hospital, Bethesda Naval Hospital. My mother and sister had been told what had happened in in those 10 days had come to D.C. So they were there. My sister was up above near the ICU. She calls down to our mom uh, drinking coffee. So she comes up and kits up in the gown. I just remember seeing her right there and pretty quickly. I commented on the coffee breath that was hitting me. <laughs> I'm not a coffee drinker, and her, she was so close to me. The coffee breath was just blasting me. Uh, I'm not a fan of coffee breath either. But I remember, no one was saying anything specific, and uh, my mind was off. I was on some heavy painkillers, and my lower body was covered in blankets. I just I wasn't looking down that way. Maybe I knew, but no one had said anything, and I didn't know mm-hmm. for a fact. And I do remember asking a medical professional to the right of my bed whether my I are my legs gone, and that I remember that person replying just 
yeah. And that's, that's tough to hear. It's tough to hear out of the blue. It's really tough to process and to think about. And you, you do have no idea at that point, or did you? You said you had a, like I a feel, suspicion. I th- I feel like I I feel like when I was in the medically induced coma, that maybe people's conversations around me were sinking in, but I I didn't know for a fact. And and to be then told in a state, you know, I'm not completely lucid at this point, but like I can comprehend what that means and what that means for the future, and that that is not the entirety of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Your legs are amputated above the knees. Your pelvis is shattered. You have a external fixator contraption sticking out of you. Don't know how long that's going to be in. You have a couple bags attached to you. One of which is a colostomy bag. And I didn't know what that was, but once someone explained it to me, I'm thinking, okay, that's something people don't want to have normally a bladder tube coming out of my bladder. My fingers are in, Uh, casts and I had a burning fever and this I had a NG tube up my nose down my throat into my stomach I was going through surgery Monday Wednesday Friday there was one week I remember Monday Wednesday Thursday Friday surgery and these are surgeries that are at a minimum seven hours sometimes 10 12 there's 14 hour surgeries I mean I was clocking 20 30 something hours a week of surgery time easy week after week after week and so my intestines weren't working. And actually with all that I had going on, this NG tube up my nose, down my throat to try to decompress my stomach because the intestines weren't working was the bane of my existence because it was I wasn't allowed to eat or drink anything because my stomach wasn't functioning. So I was fed and hydrated by IV. So you can imagine how dry your throat gets. You cannot drink a single sip of water. I was allowed to take some ice chips, but... In order to talk to anybody, I had to chew gum to generate the saliva to do so. And I had a lot of people coming in the room wanting to talk. I mean, on the day that I woke up, I'm told there were over 70 people in the visiting room creating a stressful environment for my mother. I wanted to rip that NG tube out, but I knew they'd put the thing back in and I'd be awake when they put it in. And I was awake at one point when they did put it in, not because I ripped it out, but it is not fun to have that thing inserted. And then, yeah, this fever, this inexplicable fever, we thought it was infection, but it it was an infection, but I just had this burning fever. But the worst part about that was that this fever combined with a bad mental reaction that I was having to the painkillers. I wasn't on the right kind of painkiller that worked with my mind. And so you can imagine a bad fever a bad reaction to the painkillers, nightmares, delirium, all centered around Afghanistan. My last memories. I remember one, and these are these are as real as I'm talking to you right now. These nightmares, delirium. I mean, just it was. I'm in this just like we're talking right now. There's no ability to look from an outside perspective and say, okay, this isn't real. You're going to get through this. You're going to wake up. You're in it. My platoon calling me a coward for being not on the deployment with them. And this kind of thing, being on a foot patrol, getting dismembered by some kind of rack machine. I mean, just just awful stuff. And so this is really a, I mean, the ground zero low point for me, waking up in an ICU room, finding out this is going on, and then, and then just struggling. How long is this sort of bottom time last for I was in the ICU for three weeks right off the bat I ended up going back there again but three weeks not eating not drinking NG tube and week after week of surgery so it was a good 20 plus days of just really just hell I mean the there was a a service member in the room IC room next to me it was a helicopter probably had been shot through the head I'd heard about him managed to land the helicopter and uh, at one point he died while I was in the ICU. Only two visitors could come at a time. You're hooked up to every contraption on earth, uh, monitoring your body, your, your, your body signals. They can't ever make the room dark. You're close to the nurse's station. You can't sleep. Uh, every hour they're checking you. So I wasn't sleeping. I remember if you took away surgery time that 
it was an astonishingly long time that I had last slept. And then when I could fall asleep, it, it would just be the, it would be delirium, uh, nightmares. At, at one point, my sister tells me that at about five or six in the morning, an ICU nurse who sees a lot, I mean, this is a combat ICU room in a hospital, uh, calls her crying saying that you're, you need to get in here and talk, try to help your brother. He's just breaking down. I, I don't, I don't know which one of those nightmares uh, that I've described this was, but there was a, there was just like a, a, a total bottom point. I was on Dilaudid, which is a very powerful opiate. They did shift me over to morphine and that was, that was much better for, uh, not just pain management, but also for my psyche and, and everything. <sighs> then, then do you, do you uh, start like making a turning point and they wrap up some of the surgeries and is it like a slow crawl out of the pit? It is. In addition to dealing with some of the factors of disconnection from the platoon and, and that was also going through my mind, there was there was progress and then there'd be setbacks. They'd say, it's okay, it's three steps forward, two steps back. You're just going to have to get used to this. And I'm like, well, if there's three steps forward, there were probably like 33 steps back in the beginning. Cause it's just, it seemed like that there would be setbacks. I, you know, I alluded to the fact that I couldn't eat or drink for a few weeks. At one point I'm going to do the swallow test. This is a big, a big step here. If you, if I can eat some chocolate pudding and swallow it, okay, I've passed. And then I can maybe actually take some food and not have to be fed by IV. So I took the chocolate pudding and I mean, it tasted really good. I hadn't had any food in weeks. And I remember just a couple minutes later, it all just comes back out and fail. So back on the NG tube, you know, <sighs> IV. I had a routine surgery on my hand. My right hand was damaged and there needed to be a plate put in. I had a, a tendon that was damaged. And so a very routine surgery. And I'm, I was actually out of the ICU at this point. I wake up from the surgery and I'm back in the ICU. Well, what happened? Why am I here again? And I got the admiral of the hospital on down coming through, apologizing. Something bad happened in this surgery. What was it? Well, I apparently had an abnormal amount of potassium in my system and the resident anesthesiologist, this is these are training hospitals, so they're always training new military doctors. The resident anesthesiologist either messed up or just didn't take note of the amount of potassium in my system and gave it, administered a anesthetic that releases potassium. So my system in the middle of this very routine surgery flooded with potassium and my heart stopped. I, the, I'm told by the surgeon who responded brilliantly that she had to put the chest pedals on me and, and shock me back, shock my heart back into function. And so I wake up from, I basically died and had to be resuscitated in a routine surgery after going through all of this weeks later. It's, I mean, to me, that's unacceptable, but this, you know, you're, you may think you're over the hill, but you're not. Anytime you go into surgery, it's a, it's a risk. To, it, like it seems hard to and like a lot of things had to fall the line to get you to survive coming off the battlefield but it's like just the beginning just the beginning i mean you know i'm in addition to realizing all the medical complications that i have you're thinking well, what is my life going to look like how how am i going to do basic things I mean, am i going to be in a wheelchair am i even going to get out of this hospital am i going to get through surgery will i get to walk again how am I going to shower? Can I drive a car? Dating girls? What's that going to be like? How? This was my first combat deployment. This was the first operation within the deployment. My platoon wasn't even on the ground yet. And so it just felt like, you know, why me? I would tell myself, well, okay, let's just say if someone had to up on that hill had to step like, you should want it to be you. You should say, I'm the one who can handle this. I survived. I can make a good life. Do I really feel that? Am I just saying that? I want to believe that it should have been me if it had to happen to someone. Do I really believe that? How, you know, this job felt like my calling is every, the only thing I ever wanted to do really in my career. And it just seemed like it was gone. My identity was very much wrapped up in being a team guy. 
yeah, okay, you can still stay in the teams, but guess what? I had a senior ranking officer come at one point and visit, and I was trying to do physical therapy and really was focused on my physical therapy, not talking to this individual so much, certainly not talking about career plans, and was kind of saying, well, you know, you can stay in the teams. We can send you to acquisition school. And I'm just like this. this that's just not, you know. I, I, so, okay, you're not going to do this job the way in which you'd been doing it, even if you can stay in the community. But like, as I said, you're either in a platoon or you're out of platoon. And I'm going to be out of a platoon. People say, yeah, but, you know, as an officer, you, you progress through it. You're going to be, even if this didn't happen, you'd be, you know, you'd be administrative. You'd be doing some staff tours. And then, yeah, okay, this happened on the first de- operation within the deployment it's you don't get it it's just it's not the same and but most importantly it was just i'm not going to be on this deployment with my teammates if this had to have happened to me let it happen at the very end of the deployment is what i was thinking but to be disconnected like that is uh, is tough it's and so in addition to a physical component i think there was absolutely a mental challenge that i was also dealing with what was the first like what was the first positive step or the positive light that you saw? I remember one day, and this is very basic, <laughs> but they were saying, okay, we're going to work on getting you up out of bed. And I had this shattered pelvis. It was surgically fixed with two screws. I had this external fixator that is a contraption that stayed in place for about a hundred days. They took it out surgically at one point. But that meant that I could not. You had an external fixator f- on your pelvis. Drilled, drilled for into the over a hundred days. Yeah, drilled into the. It's two crossbars extending out. You can't. I, I happen to be a stomach and side sleeper, and you know, in addition to everything else going, part of the reason with the sleep, maybe, it's just that I couldn't turn. So I'm stuck on my back, and you, when this thing gets taken out surgically, they're like, okay, you're ready to get. We need to get you out of your back off of the bed because you're developing bed sores and this kind of thing. But it's not going to be easy to balance. Like, why? Sitting up, it's not a big deal. <laughs> I sat up, they, like two, one person on either side of me, they sit me up out of the hospital bed and they let go and it was just like fall back. <laughs> Is this because your abs were or you just didn't know how to I do it I think my, yet? the system of balance in the flu, I don't know if we have fluids that kind of dictate our balance. It, that just was gone after being bedridden for, 100 days I mean definitely I had atrophied in strength mm. but I think just the whole system of balance was out so of whack so this is still not light I'm no, asking for that was like, <laughs> but 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 after a few efforts it, uh, I was able to hold it and it was like it was like doing a, like a plank or something mm-hmm. you know where you're just you're shaking and you're holding and you're concentrating but I was able to hold it for a little bit at a time and I felt okay I'm out of bed okay that's awesome at some point this means I'm going to be able to transfer into a wheelchair now and then when I get in this wheelchair I'm going to be doing laps around this hospital I'm going to do mm-hmm. as much as so many, you were fired up immediately ugh, to get out to get to get outside I mean that that was actually one of the other challenges when I became an inpatient it just didn't make sense to me why can't I just get into a courtyard just to get outside? If it's a sunny day, like that would be awesome. I love being outside. I'm a outdoors. Was there a reason for it? Is it infections? What is it? Well, I, the cynical interpretation is that when you're in an ICU, forget about it. But when you're in the inpatient status, there's a nurse who's balancing now four patients total. ICU, it's one-on-one. Mm-hmm. You have undevoted attention from your nurse. But now you're getting juggled with a few other patients. And so I had a lot of, I still had some apparatus attached to the bed and all of that would, it would take a team of people, not to mention the on, on duty nurse who then might not be able to attend to the other patients. So there was a logistic aspect to this that I think was challenging at the end of the day. You know, I felt this means so much to me. Can't you just do that? I just want to get out. I just want to get outside. And there was one, they're going to make it happen finally. And this was after a while, I think longer than it should have been. But, you know, I, I don't want to be too um, reprimanding of them. They got out into the courtyard. It was a sunny day. It was kind of like the sun had come through. And it just uh, was a very powerful moment for me just to be outside. My mom and sister were with me. And, okay, I got outside. That's, that's a step. Eventually, you get into the wheelchair. And eventually I was able to start doing laps around the hospital, pushing myself. 
I don't want people to push me, but to be able to just cover ground on my own is, I think, a basic human need that needs to be fulfilled. And when you're getting pushed in a wheelchair or on a bed by someone else, it's not the same thing. So it's about me getting in a wheelchair and be able to move. So then when, when did you start making, what was the next big step that you took? Like you're, you're now in a wheelchair, you're mm-hmm. able to get yourself around. Yeah, I think the next step was there's going to be a day pass coming up. Okay, a day pass means not the whole day, but a couple hours. I'm going to get to go out of this hospital with my mother and sister out to dinner. I'll be in a wheelchair and it'll be about two hours and you come back. So I'm in anticipation of this laying there in bed and thinking, wow, I'm going to leave this hospital. What's that going to be like? That's, gonna, that's awesome. Oh, wait. People are going to look at me. I don't look right. I don't look normal. I look different. I'm used to being anonymous. Nothing, you know, don't stand out, really. It's an average guy. Now I look different, radically different. What are, are people going to stare at me? What's, what's this going to be like? And I was just thinking, you know, I'm going to have to get used to this is my future reality, whether I'm in a wheelchair or whether I'm on prosthetic legs, you look different. And if you do not get used to this somehow, and eventually you're going to be bitter for the rest of your life. So I started thinking along these lines of, you know, body image and stuff. Whenever I get these prosthetics and I don't have them yet, whenever that is, I don't know when it's going to be. I'm going to boost them up a little bit. So I'm a little taller. <laughs> I was five, nine and I was thinking six foot would be pretty good. If people are going to look at me, I might as well be taller. <laughs> but I remember the getting on that day pass, you know, I'm sure. How pe- long had it been from like, from you showed up there until now you're getting your first day pass? I, th- I, th- I would say two solid months, Okay. two months, it, which in the grant, you know, at the time it seemed like a long time in the grand scheme of things. It, Things were moving fairly rapidly. I had the bag still. I'm about to be discharged from Bethesda, about to be an outpatient. First, I got to go to Walter Reed. That's where I'm going to do the physical therapy. I got to be an inpatient there for a few days just to get in their system. Did the day pass. My mother and sister were being taken care of by Special Operations Command. They had a program to provide housing, apartment out in town for the family of service members and also for the service members. For me, whenever I am allowed to be out of this hospital, this is a privilege and a, really a luxury that Army and Marine Corps soldiers, non-SOCOM, didn't have. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, at the time I, I didn't know any of this, but yeah, this, this was very fortunate that my mother and sister had an apartment out in town, that apartment that I would be able to go to. So the next thing in this, this is just to get get that that discharge to become an outpatient. And then after that, it's you're starting physical therapy. You're going to learn how to walk again. Okay, roger that. So now you start learning to walk. Yeah, and this and this and was... And you're an outpatient, so now you're living out in town? Living with my sister. Our mother had gone back to Kansas to resume work, and you know she felt like things were in a good place, but she had been let go... Not let go... <laughs> allowed to go to the East Coast, covered long as you need, but you know I'm living with my sister. My sister was a nurse in New York City, quit her job to come down and take care of me. And when I was an inpatient, other people were taking care of me, but there absolutely was was a phase where I was ready to be out of the hospital, but I was no means ready to take care of myself and live out in town. No way. And I'm a single guy. And so the fact that my sister did that is just so, so awesome. And she would drive me to the hospital every day for my physical therapy. And it's now it's okay. You're going to get fitted for prosthetics. You're going to do physical therapy every day. Okay. That's working out. I'm going to be working out every day. And this is a new sport. It's kind of how I thought about it. You're going to learn how to walk on these prosthetics. First, you're going to have short ones. They don't bend. Then you're going to have bending ones because I don't have knees. So the prosthetics are going to be my knee joint and it's going to be tough, but it's, you got as much time as you need. And, uh, every Monday through Friday, every day you get two hours of physical therapy. And then I have a lot of other appointments with the various departments that I fell under, plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery, et et cetera. 
So that, that was, it was just hospital days. You know, end up being in the hospital four to six hours, just about every day. As an outpatient coming in, driving there with my sister, coming back at the end of the day. And then how long was it before you were up on your kind of like normal, full-size prosthetics? Yeah, I'd say that was – so my, my goal was, okay, my platoon is coming back in March. If I could be on the knee prosthetics, the ones that bend, even if I have crutches or canes, that's okay. But just to be there on the flight, like not in a wheelchair, I, I, if I can get up on the prosthetics. So first you have to go through the short legs. That was late January, I want to say. All of February, I started eventually learning how to walk on the knees. And it, because they bend under you, it's really difficult. And you know, keeping in mind that I'd atrophied a lot, you need a lot of hip strength and core strength. This, even now, this walking a long distance because they're heavy, it's fatiguing. So you can imagine when you're really, really at this low point is very difficult. I would just be so tired at the end of the day. I had the, I remember thinking at the time, you got two hours of physical therapy. That's what's automatically provided. The physical therapists are working with other service members and they don't have time to be with you for four hours or five hours. But I was thinking, okay, if I do twice the amount of physical therapy per day, I'll get out of here in half the time. <laughs> but it, the math doesn't work like that. <laughs> but I, I also got to say, when I got to Walter Reed Physical Therapy, I was surrounded by dozens of injured service members. And some of these people were missing three limbs, four limbs. Four limbs? Three limbs? I remember one day looking at the therapy mat next to me. It, it's pretty, pretty easy to look around, and, and you can see – a quadruple amputee, or in this case, a triple amputee. I don't know what was going on in his head, but he was working hard right th right then and there to make his life better. And so once I got in that environment, it becomes competitive, and it also provides a sense of perspective. I'm not saying that perspective just let me, okay, I feel better about myself because others have it worse, but it did allow me to really highlight the unique circumstances, the conditions that I should be thankful for. Just to f realize, okay, I've got arms that work. I've got a brain that works. I can see, I can hear, I can talk. I'm not badly burnt. I'm not blinded. I'm alive. And we know people who are not here that, I mean, their families would give anything for them to be in this situation. Just be missing two legs, but to be alive. I know that. And so I'm going to be thankful for what I have, not focus on what I'm missing. That, that is really what that environment taught me. At what point did you start saying to yourself, you're going to start doing, you know, like wild shit again? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I really liked, I was a, really like hiking and running and trail running and just get out in the woods. I, I actually did a couple extreme hike, actually in hindsight, stupid hiking excursions, like either before or after deployment, because that's when you get the most amount of time, these like pre or post deployment leave excursions. But my point was, I, I just like being outside and I like being active. And so I was definitely thinking I want to run. And that's a good, a good goal to have, because in order to run, you need to be able to walk. So that kept me motivated. And, and I started, I got a hand cycle and I'm in DC at riding the hand cycle. It's not a, not a great one, but I at least was able to start getting outside and just do it by myself on a bike trail near the apartment where my sister and I were living. And were you, were you able to meet the platoon when they came home? Yeah. Yeah. So what was that like? So the generosity of someone affiliated with the hotel Del Coronado put a room up for my sister and I to go out to San Diego Coronado stay at the Hotel Del Oceanfront well I got the oceanfront room she had the other one that didn't face the ocean <laughs> but uh, uh and then the, pl the their the platoon redeployment bird kept getting delayed so like this it was supposed to be like a couple of days it ended up being like a two week stay at the Hotel Del waiting and uh, I was at North Island on the flight line when they got off I think I may have had one cane but that was that was uh, for me, at least, a very proud moment to just be at least be standing. And I don't know if any of them knew when they got off the bird that I was going to be there. I, I don't know what they were told, but uh, you know, I sh shook everybody's hand, and then 
and then the festivities commenced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, back to the hand cycle, you're starting to think about being able to do that. You're starting to push yourself. Um, what was it like? W w didn't you end up doing the New York City Marathon at some point? Oh, I did. I did. This was on a hand cycle. And uh, part of it was like hand cycle and then uh, run the last stretch. I think I hand cycled 16 miles, ran 10. And just getting out there like that and getting a sense of my athleticism, regaining a sense of my physicality was huge to realize that I can still be an athlete. There's this whole world of adaptive sports, just about anything that you want to do or had done, you can do maybe in a different, maybe it's going to take your upper body to do it, or maybe you're going to be doing it in prosthetics, but that you can be an athlete. And then I had heard about this thing called the Paralympics. And then that was very, very intriguing to me as well. What, what did you heard about it? Oh, I heard it's basically the Olympics for people with physical disabilities. And it's not the Special Olympics. It's different. It's under the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. It is – it's competitive. It's difficult. You'll get world-class coaching. You can represent the country overseas. It is a direct representation of the United States overseas. And you can be part of a team. There's all these different sports out there. There's summer, there's winter. It's just like the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Did you have any inkling of what you would be trying to do in there? I was thinking something along the lines of running or cycling. I actually, there was a recruiter, a liaison at Walter Reed, the clear place to find athletes for the Paralympic <laughs> program was Walter Reed. You got a young, <laughs> motivated soldiers, Marines, troops that are looking to get uh, – you know, looking, looking to get be, after it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so they had Rob Jones in there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was injured before Rob and Rob yeah, like is maybe a year before or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. So this is just, you know, this, this environment fed off each other. You know, Rob was just so fired up to get back <laughs> after it. You know? And, and there's some people not maybe, maybe being an athlete wasn't their thing. Uh, some people, want to get into a career. Some people uh, were struggling. Some like Rob were just, uh, just, just, uh, doing all sorts of impressive stuff. And, and I think, you know, you hear, you hear about someone before you, oh, that person, you know, it was a double amputee above the knee. They did this and that. And like, oh, wow, this is possible. And then, you, and then it create, there's a competitive environment. Rob, he was a little bit after saw me running and and then he's like, you know, I'm going to run, but I'm going to run faster than Dan, or, you know, this kind of thing. And so it was, it, it just was a good environment. It makes me think if I had gone through this in a vacuum in a bubble, yeah. would the outcome have been the same? Perhaps. I think it helped though, to have that sense of perspective and to see what other people are dealing with. And, and in some cases really struggling with, mm -hmm. but. Uh, met military medicine can pe keep people alive these days in ways just not possible. And so you're seeing, I mean, it was not uncommon to see triple amputees, quadruple amputees. And I think there was a bond in that environment that transcended your service, your rank, what you did in your service that is – different than the bond I had in the teams, but it is, is it was very special. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the recruiters come from the Paralympics and they come scoping out at Walter Reed looking <laughs> for some motivated troops who want to get some. And yeah. one of these guys introduced himself to you or something? One of the, yeah, one of the recruiters, uh, uh, she asked, do I want to go to San Diego for a sports camp? I, yeah, that sounds awesome. Trip to San Diego. And I go out there not really expecting anything, but really it's a trip to San Diego. I'll get to do some adaptive sports. Sounds good. And the coach, two coaches from the Paralympic Nordic ski team, that's cross country skiing and biathlon approached me and, Hey, you ever thought about doing biathlon? I thought that was running and swimming. <laughs> it's cross country skiing with and, target shooting. <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. Well, Hey, you know, they had like a s indoor ski erg there and like a little laser shooting station. Okay. This isn't on snow, but do you want to come to snow in a few months? It's August right now, November, late November, West Yellowstone, Montana camp. Okay. I'm there. 
Now I still had a colostomy bag. I wasn't done with surgery. The one major surgery I still had remaining was to take away the colostomy bag. And this sounds awesome. I go out to West Yellowstone. I don't know how to dress as an amputee I, with my stumps. I don't know how to, I don't know the clothing. I don't have all that. I'm in this thing called a sit ski, which now, I mean, now at a higher level, it's all carbon fiber. It's custom fit to me. It's lightweight, strong. But back then it was like a lawn chair on two skis <laughs> and it was not a, not an athletic device. But, and then, okay, cross country skiing, all you got is two poles. You got to use your, your upper body, your arms, your core, your back, and you don't get to use your lower body. You're strapped into this thing. How are you going to stop? How are you going to turn? Okay, we're figuring this out. My future teammates are just racing by me. It's like, oh, wow, they're fast. I don't know if I could ever get to that level, but at a minimum, just being outside, West Yellowstone, Montana, is one of my favorite places to cross country ski. It's near Big Sky. It's uh, just pine trees. You're in the. You feel like you're in the woods. Yeah, the trails are machine groomed, but once you're out, it's quiet. There was days we were just getting. It was a good snow. This is late November. It's not always consistent, but that year, it, fortunate for me, because if it would have been a dry year and canceled, who knows? But it was just dumping snow, which isn't always good for cross country skiing when you're trying to power through with your poles. But more than anything, I just had this connection with nature. That was so important. I had been running on the prosthetics. I wasn't trail running. I wasn't running, you know, out in the woods. I was hand cycling a little bit in DC. The cars honk at you. It's not a feeling of nature. So this was, this was just different. And I really just wanted to keep doing it. And so then what, what happens? What's the course? Cause is that, that ends up being what your first competitive sport is. Is that right? It's all I've done in the Paralympics. And I, for me, again, it started because I just wanted to be in the woods. And then it was like, okay, you could actually start doing this full, full-time training and, and get better and, and just see where you can go. Maybe you'll make a Paralympic team, get to go to the Paralympic Winter Games. Well, I'm still on active duty. I'm still in the hospital. I still have this surgery. I got through the surgery, big recovery. They cut open my core again to, take, to reconnect my intestinal system. I still, I still have orders at Walter Reed. I got to get out of the Navy I had a conversation with the head SEAL Admiral. He was like, well, we'll support you if you want to do this. Three years of training, trained for the Sochi Paralympics, assign you to Fort Carson, Colorado, 10th Special Forces Group. I'll be training up in Winter Park. I had met a coach up there in Winter Park, and they uh, they got snow. They got a training area. So I took I took orders. I mean, that again, I'm very grateful to the NSW community for doing that. It For me, I, I just – I could have gotten out, but there was something special about still being in and still training for this sport to go represent the country. And so the way I saw it, I have orders to move out to Colorado and to train. And I'm going to train and train and train. I probably trained a little bit too much and maybe overtrained in that desire to kind of work through my injury and to show that I've overcome it. Mm-hmm. And so that was for the for the Sochi. So how did that end up going? Yeah, I, I showed up there, a newer athlete. I've been doing this sport for three years, living and training in Colorado. And now that I look back on that time, I'm just wondering wh- why did someone who lost their legs and within two years move out to Colorado, didn't know anybody. I knew that local coach. Just go train in a sport that it, like 98% of my training was by myself, hours. In the off-season cross-country skiers, roller ski, I had this mountain board apparatus, so I'm on the dirt roads out there and and just training and training and training and probably working through some things, but it just felt good to be an athlete. I could train for this sport, be part of a team, follow a training plan, see progress, set long-term goals, work towards those long-term goals, put the skill, put the skills and the training of the test overseas, represent the United States if I can make a Paralympic team. This seemed like a logical thing to do for me coming out of my time in the teams and in the service. So, but I'm still in the service and I'm representing, you know, the Navy and all of that. I put a little bit of pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. I showed up at the, I did make the team for Sochi and we know now in retrospect that Russians were doing uh, performance enhancing drugs. That's 
not necessarily verifiable, but I, mean, I think plenty of people have come out and said that that was happening and maybe don't have the sample, but there was, there was a very s- tough competition. Cross country skiing is a tough sport. Uh, the distances range from 15, 18 kilometer races down to sprints. But how, what one you, did you do? I, I did six races at the Sochi games and that's, that's pretty long standard. So the longest, so it would have been six races in cross country, three, 15 kilometer, 10 kilometer, and then 800 meter sprint. And then in biathlon, 15 kilometer, 12.5 kilometer, 7.5 kilometer. These six races happen in like eight days. It's, it's intense. You don't get a lot of recovery. And I was kind of in the, the 10th, 12th place area, 14th. Uh, the fields aren't as deep as in the Olympics, but they're still very competitive. And I, th- I made the sprint final that one mm-hmm. and got sixth place in the, six out of six on the sprint final, but made it to the final. I exited Sochi, to be honest, a little bit disappointed because I think I had put too much pressure on myself. And do you think you overtrained too? I think so. I was living at very high altitude in Winter Park, Colorado, Fraser, Colorado, living at 8,700 feet. It's altitude has pros and cons. Uh, a lot of people think it's a, it's just a win-win. You're up at high altitude training for an endurance sport, but you do develop the red blood cells that improved efficiency in your, your transportation system internally, but you cannot train to the extent Mm. that you can at sea level. And so your neuromuscular system is not performing at the. So what's it best to do both? Yeah. Like high altitude and. Yeah. The model is live high, train low. If if you, if you have Uh, unlimited funds, you would be at sea level or in this case where there's snow, but lower altitude and you would lit, you would pressurize your house to be at like 10,000 feet. Assuming, <laughs> assuming, assuming you can recover, I'm you step out the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then when you, you know, and you spend a lot of time in your house and you go out and then you, now you're at, you're at sea level. So it just, you have the red blood cells from the altitude inside. And then now you're training fast and hard at a higher tempo, a higher intensity than you can at altitude. So you, you make it to the Olympics, you come in sixth, 12th, 10th, whatever, and you're all kind of pissed at yourself because you <laughs> didn't do so Well, good. I think, you know, as I look back, I mean, what, what was I expecting? I was new. I mean, yeah. do you want to just be given just show this? Up and yeah, and easy. like, it's like, there's not as much reward if it was easy. But the other thing is, I think I put too much focus on the end result that there's actually a different focus. The focus should just be on the process training, Mm -hmm. execution of the training plan, modifying as necessary, making adjustments at the end of every season based on what went well and what could have gone better. And that if I can make some changes to equipment, make some changes where I'm living, I moved to New England. And so I'd be at a lower altitude. And that if I can execute the process of, of training and preparation that, and then of course on race day, go it, dig deep and go as hard as I can in a smart way mm-hmm. that at that point you got to be happy with what happens at, at that point. So I, I ended up training for the next cycle and these are four year cycles. Well, and you moved to New England, to go to school, right? Yeah. I, to use my GI bill. And I, I just, I had some friends from the teams who had gone to the Kennedy school of uh-huh. government and wanted to go there. It was a one year program. I was very much still training a little, skeptical of whether I could get in that the training hours that I needed. I didn't know how demanding the academic program was going to be, but I found that with discipline and time management, go to bed early, wake up at my training zone, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., go to class at 10 the rest of the day and then recover. And I often in Colorado prior to in the train up for the 2014 games through boredom and through just a desire to, to, to be training and thinking, you know, this is like a buds mentality. More is better. Yeah. More is better. If you train <laughs> twice as hard, you're going to get twice as fast. It doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. And, and you Damn don't, it. Yeah, yeah. if you, <laughs> there's days you, you training has to be hard, Yeah. but then you have to give, you, you obviously know that. Well, I, I'm actually obviously may not know this. I'm, <laughs> I'm like the worst. Yeah. Echo I, is in full support of like heavy rest. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you are recovered. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you're training. So when you when you're going to school, you're training basically two hours a day. Yeah, and whereas in Colorado, I've been training like three to four at high altitude, mm-hmm. not giving myself the recovery. 
and then you start getting dialed in. You got a good coach out there that's helping you get dialed in on all this? Well, a physiologist, and it was remote coaching, but yeah, I mean, looking like uploading workouts, getting feedback, and and then in the winter, I I was exploring. Okay, the because the it was twenty. The first year I skied, I did not ski with the team. The next year, I needed to ski with the team internationally to be able to qualify for the games in 2018. And I was working out, okay, like I can train up in Vermont. There's a really good center at Craftsbury, Vermont for Nordic skiing. And there's a coach who will help me with biathlon. I can drive there. If I take, you know, compressed classes to be like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I can drive up there Thursday afternoon, train Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And then there's a ski track in Boston. I can't do biathlon there, but it's- There's a what? A ski a, shack? A ski, a, a, sorry, a ski track. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, uh, they make snow from the Charles River, and it's about a t- by time, like 15 minute drive, so I can do a workout there. And I'm like, I, th- I think this is possible. Mm-hmm. So I, I I think I can be a student and train. And how hard was school? Was, was Were they pushing you hard? It was difficult if you did all the work and if you did all the reading. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, I don't know many people that can actually do all the reading. I was also training as a full time athlete. Yeah. It, you but, got it done is what I'm Yeah, hearing. I got it done <laughs> and I got good grades. I, I think. I think they're not in the business of, of trying to separate people out. Right. You know, you're but there. Then, didn't you go to Didn't you go to Divinity School as well? So what was that yeah. all about? I had gone to the Kennedy School, and I really liked being in class and learning from people and seeing new ideas. You don't have to agree with them, but it's. I'd gone to a military school for college. I just thought this is this is a good opportunity, and I met some students from the Divinity School, and they said it's not. It's not what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. You can go into the ministry if you're inclined, but there's this other program. It's just an academic study of religion or questions that religion is trying to answer. And so I thought, well, I'll apply. And I was accepted. I studied ethics there. And I got to take some classes through electives. It was a, very, a wonderful program in the sense that it was broad and I can kind of just take whatever interested me. I took some classes on Buddhism and... I'm not a Buddhist, but there was something in my exposure to that way of thinking that really resonated in the athlete in me. This idea that, you know, life is suffering and I can identify with that. Even when you are happy, you're suffering because you know that that happiness is not permanent and that there's a way to that, that this suffering comes ultimately from our desire and craving uh, for, for happiness, that there's a way to end this suffering, and that is through a process, but the process can involve mindfulness and meditation. And so I was exposed to that. And I think when I was in the teams, I would have scoffed at this, but I was thinking now I'm of the point where I am trying to get every – tenth of a percent of performance that I can. And if this was the difference between getting fourth place and getting third and I didn't do it, well, I just at least want to know, I tried everything that could help me be a better human, a better athlete. And in biathlon, the reality is you're skiing hard and you have to come into the range and you have to place five shots precisely with other athletes next to you shooting an announcer saying something, a crowd, your heart beating, uh, maybe numb fingers from the cold, pressure, knowing you need to hit the shots, that if you can cultivate an ability to be aware of your mind and be aware more quickly when your mind has drifted away from the task right in front of you, that that could be a competitive advantage. Not to mention cultivating this ability to just focus and to focus on your breath or to have the ability to, through breathing, recenter yourself. I think that this is actually something that I could have benefited from highly when I was in the teams. The ability to be aware of where your mind is. It's almost like you're developing an outside view of your mind and you can see when it's gone away. And so I started developing this kind of practice just through some classes I took. And, and that kind of exposure was exactly why I did the, the Divinity School program. Yeah, I've been running into a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, I, uh, yeah, in the book Leadership Strategy and Tactics, I talk about how my, my very first platoon, I was, we were doing uh, gas oil platforms and I basically 
we were online, no one's making a call, and I kind of stepped back and looked around and, and and made a call and got praised for it. You know, I was kind of expecting as a new guy to get told shut up, but but it was like the initial idea in my head of taking a step back and detaching and being in a position mentally where you're looking around and you're not in the problem, but you're outside the problem. And that was really beneficial to me. And then, you know, I've come to find out, uh, like, for instance, when you take a step back and you, well, when you're, when your field of vision opens up more broadly, it relaxes you. That's why when you go to the ocean and you look at the sunset, you feel relaxed. That's why when you stand on a mountaintop and you look out over, you know, vast span of land, you feel more relaxed. Those things, those are physiological things that happen because as a, as a animal, if there's a movement in the jungle, like a tiger, you need to focus on that and it it amps up your heart rate and it gets you ready to fight, puts adrenaline in your system. Yet the opposite of that is when you, when you open up your field of vision, it becomes, it relaxes you. So kind of unintentionally for me as a young seal, I figured out, hey, if I take a step back and look around, I'm more relaxed. Mm -hmm. It it was more of a byproduct. It wasn't I was doing it too relaxed. And then the other thing that I figured out was like, anytime you'd hear someone panicking on the radio, screaming, you're like, hey, what are you doing? I need people over here or whatever. (laughs) And so you'd make fun of that guy. We'd make fun of those (laughs) people. And so I would always, when I was gonna key up my radio, I'd take a breath. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when you take a breath, that also calms you down. So f- I kind of stumbled into these things and other things throughout my career that now when I either learn about the physiological the physiological things that happen in our body that also people use things like meditation to drive these same physiological things, I kind of like got lucky and stumbled upon them and just you know, now I'm sort of starting to put two and two together now as I get older and learn more about the world. You know, these physiological things that I sort of stumbled upon, mm. people go out and seek and figure out. And, you know, same thing with like jujitsu. If you lose your temper during jujitsu, you're going to lose. Like, if you start getting mm-hmm. mad, you're going to lose. So I realized, oh, I, how, do I, how do I keep that in check? Oh, you know, same thing. Take a breath. Don't let, don't get caught up in the moment. And I got very, very lucky to kind of stumble on these things in my in my career, so that by the time I was, you know, you know, I was a platoon commander and a task unit commander, I was like, oh, yeah, take a step back, look around, make sure you don't get caught up in the problem. Um, mm-hmm. Interesting stuff. Yeah, I I think this is an opportunity for me. It would be 10, 12 minutes a day, and I just get in a quiet space, close my eyes, and try to follow my breath and. I can use this as an opportunity to visualize a race, how I want the race to go, but also some things that might go wrong during the race and how I want to react, mm-hmm. miss a shot. Sometimes the next shot is- Do you get anger. another shot? You, you take five shots on five targets. And you only get five shots? Five shots. If you miss, If you, you miss, miss, it's a penalty lap or a one minute penalty, depending on the length of the race. Got it. And you do either two or four stages. So that's either a 10 shot total race or a 20 shot total Mm -hmm. race. And I've noticed in the past that if I have a miss, the next shot is almost like an anger shot (laughs) or a frustration shot instead of, so you, as an example, this could be an opportunity to visualize missing a shot. That doesn't mean I'm, it's going to predispose me to miss that shot. It just means I can work on having the response to a miss in the event that that happens and the, the kind of response I want to have, which is, it's just the next shot. Yeah. It's one shot at a time. Yeah. Just take the next shot. But it's also a chance to track my breathing, which is you know very critical in shooting, the timing of your breath with the trigger squeeze and side alignment. So what you notice is that your brain just goes all over the place when you're trying to focus in a calm room. You are only doing that. You don't need to eat right now. You don't need to drink. You don't need to sleep. You don't need to talk to anybody or socialize. You're just tracking your breath. And I can't even do it. (laughs) My mind's going all over the place. But guess what happens during a race? My mind's going all over the place. So the quicker that I can notice when my mind has wandered and bring it back to the breath, this is just a simple exercise to just notice when your mind has wandered Mm -hmm. and bring it back to the task at hand. This... And for a tactical leader, anyone in a tactical environment or an athletic environment, I think this is this is golden stuff. And it just takes a little bit of discipline, doing it every day, and just working on this ability to notice your mind, just notice where it's going, 
it's not a problem that it's drifted. It's going to drift. It's just working on noticing that it's drifted a little bit quicker and then bring it back. So you work the breath, you work the the skills, you're at the right altitude, you're training, you're going to school, you rolled into the 2018 Paralympic Games and yes. you're ready to rock and roll. I think so. In retrospect, I was I was very much ready to rock and roll. I I Where were those games? They were in Pyeongchang, South Korea, okay. and I would be going as a full-time graduate student, but what that meant was that just lucky for me, it lined up with spring break and I was going to skip a week of class. So I'd be gone for two weeks total, but only miss one week of class. My spring break was competing in Korea. I didn't have any sense of pressure or expectation. My competitors aren't in graduate school. I don't, you know, no one expects me to do anything. I'm not one of the people that the media pre-picks to do well. I didn't have good results. I qualified, whatever but I've been training, going up to Vermont. I was ready to go, showed up. The plan was to do six races in that about eight day span, three biathlon, three cross country. The first race was the morning after the opening ceremony, didn't go to the opening ceremony, wanted to be rested. The first race is a sprint biathlon, which is a tough race because you you don't have time to take that cool couple down. breath yeah. extra to hit the, you know, you got to, cause it's such a short ski race. It's a <laughs> 7.5 kilometer ski race. You got to go hard and you got to shoot fast and you got to your shots. And it, was, it was a windy day. And not to mention of the, of all the races to put first, I think that's like the hardest one because you're amped up and in <laughs> biathlon, I have a different optimal mental state than I do in cross country and cross country. I am, I want to be just ready. It's to like psycho, go. right? Yeah. Like I am going to, there's no holding back, bury myself on this race. <laughs> and in biathlon, if you have that attitude in Sochi, the first race off the bat was the sprint biathlon. And like, I came in way too hot and missed three shots out of mind, like <laughs> way too hot. But that was a learning point. Yeah, and yeah, I, in sure. Sochi, I also learned, do not look at the big screen that has the real time race results. I'd ski by it and look at it and see where I was. Don't do that. Don't listen to the announcer. It comes in one ear out the other. Like I had learned a lot of lessons that I was going to rigidly try to apply and just take one race at the time. Don't think about the next race. If a race goes bad or if, if even five minutes ago, something bad happened in this race, it's gone. The only thing you can do is affect right now. I can't affect five minutes ago. If I do things properly now, the future will be the way I want it to be, but I can't be, it does no good to think about the future. All I can do is act right here and right now. What's right in front of me. If it's a hill, I'm going to attack the hill. I'm not going to be thinking about what's going to happen in three minutes when I hit the shooting range. So that was kind of my mindset. This was informed by some of the classes I had taken and just, I was going to apply this and just see how it goes. You know, the first race skied the first lap. I, we had good skis. It was a hilly course. This is a good advantage for me. Windy day went through first shot hit second hit third shot hit fourth shot hit fifth shot hit get out and go bypass the penalty loop all right good start ski the second lap it's about seven minutes per lap coming to the range all right i'm a shooter now let's go glasses up get to the mat lay down take the rifle check out the wind it was windy kind of gusting and swirling and first shot hit, second shot hit, third shot hit, fourth shot hit. And then I started like, oh my God, I got to hit the shot. And <laughs> my rhythm was off. And I'm like, oh, okay, take a couple breaths. Okay. And then I lined up the sights and squeezed off the round and I jerked the trigger and it was a miss. And I, got, I got up just mad, like, ah. So I skied into the penalty loop, skied it, and then I exited the penalty loop. And pretty quickly, there was a coach there yelling like, hey, everybody, everybody's missed. Every, like all the key players have missed. It's okay, clean slate, let's go. Mm -hmm. Either way, you go either way. But, but it's yeah, nice but, to know. But, <laughs> nice to know everybody's like the top guys. Have so I went as hard as I could on that last lap. And I, I remember coming into the finish line. You don't, because it's individual starts, it's not head to head, mm -hmm. it's like a time trial. Mm -hmm. You don't know, you have a general idea. I knew that probably okay i'm in contention right but you don't know to the second where you are it's you just have to find ways to push yourself knowing that every second counts in that last stretch going as hard as i could across the line and i had told myself i'm not looking up at that screen 
to see the race results. I'm not doing it, not doing it during the race and I'm not doing it after. And so I crossed the line, I didn't know how I finished and I just go out and I like eating a recovery bar and someone was taking a few minutes later, taking off the timing chip and they said, oh, an American won. <laughs> Who was it? I don't know, it's got a kind of a weird last name and my two other teammates in the race had pretty easy to pronounce name. So I was thinking, <laughs> maybe that was me. It, it, it was, it was seven seconds separation between first and second, a Belarusian athlete got second place. And that, that was unexpected. It was gold very, medal, gold medal out of the gate, out of the gate for good way to start the games. So. <laughs> yeah. And then you kept rocking through the, through the games. Yeah. It was tough races. The next day's race, I was going one race at a time and the next race was a very difficult, the 15 kilometer cross country race, actually on the first lap, had a great first lap and was right where you would wanna be. On the second lap, I didn't take into account, it was warm, the sun was kind of degrading the tracks. I had done the first lap on this critical, fast, sweeping downhill left turn in the track, which kind of guides you around. You can be in the track or out of the track, but I had been in the track in a tuck, low aerodynamic. The second lap, low aerodynamic, same thing. I didn't take into account the tracks had degraded, other skiers had gone through, they had created some exit channels. So I was in that tuck and just like all splayed out, totally wiped out. And I got up and I had blood on my arm. I was racing in a t-shirt, it was so warm. This is the winter games, <laughs> but none of my equipment was broken. I started skiing and really was just thinking, it's not about quitting or any of that. I've proven, I can do, th it's about being a smart athlete. I got four races to go. This one is two lap. it's a five lap race, 15 kilometers, 35 or so more minutes. Does it really make sense to go hard and get like eighth place, ninth place? I can try to work my way back into this, but you know, it's, this race is gonna make me tired. I got four more to go. Maybe it's actually better to sit it out or to, to to you know, exit the course and just just be done. It's a it's a do not finish, did not finish course. But I was kind of skiing at like three quarters effort. I had lost all this momentum that would have carried me up and over the next hill. I'm like, you know, digging that, digging myself out of that hole. I just don't know if it makes sense. A coach was yelling, "You're still in it. Go, go, go!" So I just kind of responded to the coach, like an athlete, and and started going. And I'm like, well, let's just see what you know. It's the games. I've trained years for this. Let's just go. Let's see what happens. I got 35 minutes to, to work my way back into it. I got time. It's looking at it a different way. Instead of like, does it make sense to go hard for 35 minutes? It's, well, I got 35 minutes, let's go. <laughs> so I kinda, I was, I was seeing my progress improve. You get lap splits, but again, you're just pushing yourself. My lap splits after every lap were getting a little bit better. And then on the last lap, it was, it was kind of like five of us are kind of in it. They don't exactly know where, you gotta go. And so, I just, I went really hard and I crossed the line and I ended up getting second. But uh, for me, I'm actually more proud of this race than the gold medal race because I think that in sports, it's it's all about character development. S the sport in the race itself, the, in the medal, none of that really matters. What matters is what is the person that it's making you and you actually learn more from setbacks and okay, I got second place. Whatever place I got that day, it was about taking a fall despite all my training in the lead up, sometimes you make mistakes or sometimes just things happen, right? It's about getting up and, and I had doubt, doubt kind of was working its way into my mind. That's probably natural, but working through that doubt by doing what I trained to do, which is to push hard and go hard to the finish line. And so for me, this race is more meaningful in an internal way. Of course, the previous day's race, I got to see the flag go up. That was very special too, but the cross country race the next day was was more meaningful in, in that sense. And you end up with uh, one gold, four silvers, and one bronze. Yes, I, I had a, I just was in that really sweet spot of physical peak mental peak all lining up in a four-year cycle, really like a seven-year cycle because I've been doing this, trying to train since 2011, 2012, moving out to Colorado. So timing that, and I was 37 years old, I felt like it's the blend the, the blend of 
time in the sport, seven plus years plus not being over 40 like I am now, <laughs> which helps with recovery and everything, that it was just everything was lining up. And, and the course, no doubt, played into my strengths with hill climbing. And you end up getting the uh, the best male athlete of the games. Is that right? That's right. I, 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 I think <laughs> that's kind of like stud scenario, right? <laughs> well, I, you know, I think you're supposed to say this. Well, it's not about medals or awards. But of course, I'm proud of it and that I performed like that, that I think it was a, a fair and clean field and that I got to represent the United States overseas. And for me, this was just a, a time that I could think, you know, all of this work, most of it was unseen. Yeah, you get on a on a, podi a podium ceremony or get voted the best male athlete, but nobody saw the hard work I was doing in Colorado back in the day on those dirt roads when I'm by myself in the summer. And that's actually what I'm most proud of. And what is most meaningful for me was, was that. It wasn't the end result of winning or getting second or whatever the race result was. It was putting in the work and pushing myself and growing and reconnecting with nature and all of it, but really it, it was about the work and the training. So where are we at now? So that was, that was 2018. Yeah, 2018, unexpectedly, I, I did unexpectedly well. And then that opened up some opportunities and, that I didn't see coming or expect. But, you know, I had, after my injury, I stayed, I didn't talk about, I didn't talk about it. I have, I've read about General Ulysses S. Grant serving in the Civil War and refusing to cash in on his service not to write a memoir at the in the very end of his life he did because his wife was dying and he he was broke broke <laughs> he had been swindled and so he decided to write a memoir i i just i didn't feel comfortable talking about my injury i didn't even have anybody asking me to talk about my injury so it was pretty easy not to have to talk about it so when i was out there just training i was just doing the work doing the work doing the work and now all of a sudden it's like oh i have these opportunities to like uh, monetize or what, you know, just, I can actually create opportunities to give talks and this kind of thing. And that came my way. And I had to do some soul searching. Is this, is this right for me, for me in where I'm at and what I want to do? And I thought if I try it, it's a challenge because there's a couple things going on. If I'm going to be honest with myself, one, I'm not comfortable publicly speaking. <laughs> Let's just be honest about it. I'm not comfortable. It's like getting in the water or trying to jump out of an airplane. It's in that realm. That really, and, it, and then the other thing is I, I just don't know. I mean, in the teams, we're getting told, you know, you be a quiet professional. Just put in the hard work. Don't seek glory, this kind of thing. So that was all going on. But Okay, I'll try. I'll just at least try to develop a narrative and, and see how it goes. And... I worked on that a lot and then I started giving some talks and that came about because I got some medals and did had those results. Those opportunities didn't exist even though I'm the same person with essentially the same background in 2014. Yeah, Jack. That's just how things work in this world. Yeah, and I mean from my perspective obviously uh I look at it as not so much you taking the opportunity to monetize what you've been through. But to me, it's more important to go out there and share what you've been through because it can legitimately help out a lot of people. And, um, you know, I had one of our admirals one time tell me, you know, we, we were having a talk. I had a book coming out and, you know, he said something along the lines of, you know, I was like, well, you know, this is this is not really the quiet professional for me to be doing this. And he said something along the lines of, hey, we need to be quiet professionals, but that doesn't mean silent professionals and there's stories that should be told. And as far as I, it, my opinion is you have a story that should absolutely be told. And I mean, when you're talking and we probably could do a nine hour podcast if we went back and got like medical records, when you're talking about all the things that you were going through from the time you woke up in the hospital, like I'm a baby. 
Like I, I'm hearing the things that you, I'm, I'm like mad if you know, oh, uh, you know, like the, the floor's cold when I get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I'm like, oh, this is, weird. you know what I mean? Like, we're, or like I'll, I'll get like a sprained ankle and I'll have to wear an ankle brace and I'll be like, I'm so mad about it. You know, I'm sitting here just thinking, man, the perspective that you have and, and then you took it even one step further. Like you're sitting there w- with a guy that's a triple amputee and he's over there getting after it, trying to make his life better. So, man, I think to, to the contrary of what you're kind of saying about like, oh, trying to monetize this and the silent professional, it's like, hey man, this is things that are gonna help people, a lot of people that are in a tough spot and, and also, you know, team guys that are gonna go through tough situations and, and, and just other veterans that just all human beings, man, life is hard. And, and for someone like you that's been through the hardest of situation and still be able to get up and every day keep getting after it, man, that's like, that's you. I would actually tell you if you're not sharing this story, I think that's actually kind of wrong, bro, to be honest with you. Yeah, and that is the side of the fence I'm on right now is that it actually could be selfish of me to not tell my story to, to for some valorized concept of you know whatever not not cashing in or it, but really this it the opportunity presented itself because of some success that I didn't have four years prior but now there's some opportunities to talk my friend from the teams started this company O2X that is doing awesome work and there I don't have any holdups of going and giving classes to firefighters and, and other public service professionals as part of the O2X team, teaching principles of resilience or mental toughness, grit, whatever you want to call it, but also working on goal setting. Cause I, in my own life, setting goals as an athlete, setting goals after my injury, setting goals at the Naval Academy, that all really helped me. And it doesn't mean you have to have goals, but if you have a powerful long-term goal, that can be a very, a very potent force to help you get through difficult situations. But sometimes those long-term goals can be discouraging in the moment of intensity. And so you're teaching, you know, setting middle term as as an athlete year to year, I set performance goals based on various different categories of performance that do not entirely include physical training. It's a lot of things, nutrition, sleep, uh, mental skills, and this kind of thing, tactical, technical, and so also teaching them that in the moment of a tactical situation when the chaos is just everywhere, that you can set micro goals just to be aware of that, that, that this idea of you're never out of the fight, there's always something you can do, one more step forward, something that can contribute positively, that this is very powerful. And also what you taught me, I teach them as well, prioritize and execute what's the most important thing that you need to be focusing on right now, either act on it yourself or delegate it. And then what's the next most important thing? With improvement in experience and training, you can more quickly identify what is the most important thing to work on. But yeah, just passing on those lessons learned to tactical athletes as part of O2X, like, that's just a no brainer. I, I love being part of the team to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so are you training for 2022 now? Well, I competed recently in the 2022 Beijing Winter Games, and I came back with one gold medal as part of a team relay. And it, again, was a six-race individual format with the very last day being a team event. And the first race off the bat was that same biathlon. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so now I'm going in with, okay, I've had four years since 2018. I knew that going in, there would be a, there would be a little bit more attention directed uh, to whatever extent that would be. It would be more than before 2018, which was nothing. So that there's going to be maybe some more people wanting to do an interview or some media outlets or some maybe sponsorship opportunities, this kind of thing. And with that, I started to feel, okay, somebody sponsors you. They want you to get a medal. <laughs> <laughs> they want you to perform. This is a different situation. So yeah. going into 2014, brand new, didn't know anything. Going into 2018, more experienced, but with no expectations, either externally or internally. Uh-huh. Now, external expectations probably, even yeah. though no one's going to say that, 
but really some internal expectations because I'm perceiving those external expectations. <laughs> that was a different, a different, different, just every, each one of the games I've been to is different in that sense. But of course, training, just focus on what you can do, execute the training plan, working through getting, you know, positive communication with the coaches, work, adjusting the training plan. COVID happened that didn't interrupt my personal training so much, but it interrupted the competitive scene mm. somewhat. And then this season, just doing a lot of altitude uh, exposure training, actually in Bozeman, Montana with the team, focusing on biathlon support at the range we have there and showed up that first biathlon was again, as usual, I'm just really amped up on that one because it's the first race and just you've been training and the course in China was not as advantageous for my strengths as an athlete as it was in 2018, but it was going to be a grind, really slow snow, uh, totally dehydrated it snow. It was weird to watch. Weird snow. Like there was just dirt on the sides yeah, and stuff. Really windy place, just cr- and like blowing. So they groomed the course overnight or whenever they did it. And then you show up in the morning, but the, the wind was picking up outlying snow and blowing it into the tra- and so and that was just the slowest stuff ever so this is going to be some challenges it's going to be a grind in that first race we were competing against chinese athletes i hadn't seen i hadn't seen them in the competitive circuit and and keeping in mind i'm a sit skier there is i would say a lot less technique in cross-country sit skiing than there is in cross-country standing skiing because we're only maneuvering our poles so there is, I think, an ability to rapidly develop athletes in my sport sitting as compared to in the standing discipline. But that first race, <clears throat> I'm very proud of it. I, I came in, hit five shots, came in again for the second and final shooting stage, hit five shots. It was windy, skied hard, absolutely went as hard as I could on the last lap because I was just off of third place. The last split I got was on the last lap, just having hit all 10 shots, you're five seconds off third place. <laughs> that, is, that is a motive, like motivating. I, okay, I, I just was about, I, and, and we're at altitude. So I crossed the line and, and I hadn't done a lot of racing at 5,500 feet like we were. Trained at it, but at a games race at that altitude, it, when you're going absolutely as hard as you can, it's painful. And I finished that race in fourth place, but I can tell you that that was p- perhaps in my own estimation, the best race I've ever had. It doesn't matter what place it was. It, <laughs> j- of course, getting on the podium is nice, but it's about the execution of your own race. You do not control who else is out there. The second race the next day was 18 kilometers. Again, one of the better races I felt like I've ever executed in terms of pacing, sixth place. And then races number three and four didn't go so well. I sat one out was named to the relay team. Our relay team consisted of four legs. I was the third leg. And at this point, my mentality is just take what I was given and try to gain a a couple seconds or something, pass it off to the anchor leg. And we unexpectedly got first place. We we beat uh, some more favored teams. And so I ended up getting to come home with the gold medal. I can tell you that that was a more special experience than an individual medal part of the team to be part of a team and i think i felt it no i know i felt it during the race the difference of an individual race versus a race where someone passed it off to you and you're going to pass it off to someone else and you don't want to let them down they're counting on you and they're counting on you and there's and that's a different and so for an individual sport to have that team element is just awesome man right on um i guess that brings us up to kind of where we're at today uh is there anything else echo you got any questions probably a good place to wrap it up i mean yeah echo you got any questions yeah we were talking um before we started recording about jujitsu and you were asking pretty kind of hardcore about the tournament scenario how it's laid out is that to indicate that you are considering doing (laughs) jujitsu well i was asking jocko is this possible you know is there a a, adaptive jujitsu adaptive martial arts yeah well actually let me rephrase that there is no like you would compete with other dudes and there is no well i've never seen i've never seen like oh he, you know here's a, a bunch of guys without legs that are going to do jujitsu because no you'll compete against other dudes because jujitsu itself is adaptive and so you would figure out moves that work for you that 
he would figure out how to do it. And there's like there's competitive wrestlers. There's wrestlers that have fought in the NCAA's that have one leg, no leg, no legs, mm-hmm. um, and they just adapt their body to figure out how to win. And so yeah, there's it, the sport itself is adaptive, but there would be no like other special rules. I mean, you go to a jiu-jitsu competition, there'll be people there that are blind. They do have one rule, like in wrestling, the if it's a blind wrestler, they have to you have to maintain contact with them. But that's the only rule. Is that uh, that's wrestling too. Yeah, I don't even know if that's jujitsu or not. Yeah. Huh. But um there's we, we we have friends that I mean I have a friend that's paralyzed, you know, uh pretty much chest down. He does jujitsu. That's awesome. Um and there's definitely, like I said, there's people with one legs. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the greatest jujitsu players of, of all time, Jean Jacques Machado. He only has uh, a few fingers on one of his hands. And in jujitsu, grips are really important. We got another friend named Jeffrey Al. Mm-hmm. Jeffrey Al has one hand, and he competes all the time. And he just competes. There's no yep. there's no special category other than get some. Yep. Yeah. That's true. I'm here for a few days, so maybe I could come and take a class. <laughs> one of, one of the things I learned, and I guess the ultimate thing I've learned as an athlete and uh, Paralympic sport for 10 years. And the thing I was telling myself most recently in Beijing was it's not about results. It's not about how you feel today. It doesn't, no one cares where you came from. No one cares how old you are. No one cares what you look like. No one cares how much money you got, how many degrees you have. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is what you can do right here and right now. That's all that matters. And ultimately your opponent is yourself. The voice inside you that's saying, I don't know if I can do this. The voice inside you that's saying, don't go that hard. It's painful. That voice, that's, that's actually what you're competing against. Yeah. And I think in martial arts, it's probably perhaps even more true than in cross country skiing. Yeah, when we had Rob Jones out, we did a uh, we did some mat work with him. Yeah, see if we could give him that little jujitsu bug. Remember Kyle Maynard? You knew who that yeah. is. Yeah, no arms, no yeah. legs. Yeah, straight wow. up. Yep. And he would train. And he, yeah, I trained with him before. He I don't, that was a long time. He might be even be a black belt by now. So Dang. Old school. Yep. No arms. No so legs. yeah, man, jujitsu is for everybody. <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> for everybody. Yep. Uh, you, hey, you know we're going. We're over three hours right now. Anything? Yeah. Do, anything else that we didn't cover? Anything else you no, want to hit on? Think Any final closing thoughts? Covered my life thoroughly. I <laughs> very unpacked my life and uh, brought up a lot of memories. So I, I appreciate you providing this platform and for asking me to be part of your podcast. It's an honor. Yeah, I, I don't know why it's taken t- so long. Hey, if people want to find you, it's dankanason.com, right? Yes, I do have a website. That's that's where people yeah, can find you can if find, they yeah. want to. You, yeah. you can go speak. You can go and uh, help them out. Um, they can find you on there. Yeah. You don't have any social media, do you? No, I, I got on LinkedIn. Begrud- that's not social media, Holmes. <laughs> Begrudgingly, that's not social but media. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a social media. That's... That's one line that I'm not ready to cross right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, right on. Uh, you got the website, though, and if people want to contact you, they can find you through there, which yeah. is awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jocko. Cool, man. Thanks for coming on. Um, thanks for sharing your lesson learned for sure. Uh, and, and you know, more important, thanks for what you did for the country. Thanks for what you did for the teams. Thanks for what you've done since representing America. Uh, that's awesome, and and really, it's just it's always uh, an incredible example for me. Just knowing that you're out there, and no matter what's happening, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've been through, I know for a fact you're still getting up and you're getting after it. And I appreciate being able to follow that example, man. Thank you. Thanks, Chaco. And with that, Dan Kanawson has left the building. Echo Charles. Yes, sir. What was your assessment? Okay, so the first thing, what I didn't even realize until a few minutes in is when Jason Gardner makes his speech, one of his many, about training works, Mm -hmm. and he tells the story, he was talking about this guy, right? Yeah, 100%. That was him. That's crazy. Because to me, that's one of the better speeches, especially from Jason Gardner. Like that, that's a, that's a, re- that's one I look forward to, yeah. you know, because the way he says it yeah. and You're like the lesson. At the, so at so the muster, at the muster yeah. Jason talks about the effectiveness of training and so sure enough, and I didn't want to go through all the details and misspeak anything, but some of those details that I did cover uh, for sure. But I'll, I'll tell you what, man, and I kind of talked about it, but like the amount, like waking up after being in a coma for 10 days, and then having just 
the insane medical issues. Just insane medical issues. No legs, freaking abdomen blown apart, colostomy bag, the thing going down your throat, not even allowed to drink one sip of water. You know, like I get complaint I have a sore, like here's here's my complaint. Like, yeah, you, know know doing, you know you're doing jujitsu mm. and you and you cut your mouth? Sure. Like you cut, you bite your tongue, you get yeah, ripped, you, yeah, get, you get catch get the, the teeth, and then you can't like eat an acidic food yeah. for like a week. <laughs> it's true. Like, and I'm complaining <laughs> about this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Dan's over there for, for a hundred days or whatever with a freaking tube down his throat and he's not allowed to have one sip of water. So this is another one of those situations where you just think, man, you have so, so nothing to complain about. There's so nothing to complain about. And Dan just has a freaking awesome attitude. When he said that about when he woke up and did, you know, like no time, no passage of time like that. Situ- so I got a concussion, like a bad one, the mm-hmm. kind where you have amnesia for a long time. Like, so basically it's like a super, super duper, duper, duper mild version of that experience. So, so you've was, basically been through the same thing as yeah, that's a bit, So I can relate. <laughs> so I, 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 it was in a football game. I hit this guy and then got knocked out. But the knockout, like where my body was limp, only lasted for like, it was like a flash knockout. So mm-hmm. they helped me up and I was all like weary. But everyone on, the, on my team saw me and knew I was like. Out. Yeah. Out of it. So they pushed, they put me to the sideline. Apparently, the, I don't remember any of this part. So, but when I came to, I was just standing there on the sideline. And it was weird because just like how he said is, but I had amnesia too, though. That's that, that was a weird thing. Mm-hmm. I didn't remember. And I don't even know where I was, like the kind where I'm just all oh, standing here, you know. <laughs> so, but it's so cur- like, especially as a little teenager, right? It's high school time. It's so scary because you don't you, it's like you don't know what's going on at all. And it, nothing is mm-hmm. like making sense or whatever. So, man, I just kind of broke down and started crying. And my brother's like, and my brother's on the same team, obviously. He's like kind of worried and stuff. He's calling the, the trainer or whatever, the doctor. And they're asking me all these questions. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know anything. And it's weird. And it's really freaky. Mm-hmm. Now that, you're in the hospital. <sighs> man. But, man, I was feeling, I was like, that is crazy, man. That's a crazy experience. The, yeah. um, the, the level of discomfort is like unimaginable right again yeah you know for me i get a cut in my mouth and i'm like i can't eat ketchup for a week or whatever you know it's gonna sting right and he's just you know lost his legs got the freaking tube down his nose Mm -hmm. uh having heinous real nightmares that he thinks are real yeah like this is crazy so and then for him, I mean, can you, is there a nicer guy out there? You know, just as nice as they, totally nice guy, um, humble, like just freaking incredible. So he did say something he, and, and he only said it real quick too and just continued to move on. But it was, a, it, it told a lot of the story on his little, on his mindset mm-hmm. when he said, oh, when he started, uh, I think when he started sitting up. Right. Yeah. And when then when he was considering, you know, before he went into rehab, he said, OK, this is like my new sport. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I see what you did there. And that's huge. That's a huge deal where you don't look at it as like, oh, my gosh, I'm starting from like I was at 10 and now I have to go all the way back to one. It's, it's no, it's not that it's like a, a new sport. Yep. It's like a new challenge yeah, that you can yeah. start from the year almost like in a way your original starting spot because it's, it's, you're right. new to this sport, right? Just a new, it's a new sport. New yeah. thing, yeah. And then boom, you kind of gamify it in that way where it's like, oh shoot, now I can sit up. Oh, okay, now I can take some steps. Okay, I can use this. And it's like this this sport. Yeah. And it makes sense too because look at him. Paralympics, no big deal. Yeah. Winning. That being said, you can gamify that stuff, but at the end of the day, you can't get out of the game. And yeah, that and that's true. why you have to have that that like just incredible mindset um, to look at it. And you know, we, we when we had Jim Sorlsley on, and you know he had he had lost both legs and one arm in Vietnam, and and that that talk that he had with us after the podcast when he was talking about Lewis Puller Jr. and he said that Lewis Puller Jr. never accepted a hundred percent what had happened to him, mm-hmm. and. And he's like, and I did. Mm-hmm. And you, you could hear Dan 
talking about that today. You know, there's, you know, he said there was, there were, there was times. He's talking past tense. Yeah. Like it, it, there was times where he would be like, "Oh, why did this happen to me? Oh, do I really think it was the?" You know, he said this happened to me because I could take it. And then he said, "I question myself. Did I real? Do I really think that?" Mm-hmm. And he was doing it in the past tense. So he got to a point where he's like, "Okay, this is me. This is my life." And what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go freaking kick ass. I'm gonna become an awesome athlete. I'm gonna win a bunch of freaking Olympic medals. I mean, it's just, it's just awesome, yeah. awesome example um, as a human. So, anyways, honor to have him on here, Dan. Thanks for coming on, brother. And um, yeah, if you want to help out, if you want to support, if you want to support yourself, yeah, you can do it. It's true. By, by getting good fuel in your system. Yep. Improving your situation, whatever that may be. Yeah, right? yeah. Physical is a big one, and mental, by the way. So we have what? Discipline, go. Energy, drink. I've been drink. I've been utilizing these all week. Oh yeah. And it's only the second day. Highly week, productive week way. so far. Yeah, so far we got a big one. You know, I don't say I don't run around saying I'm so busy all the time. I don't say I'm not busy, but I will say this week I'm a little bit busy. A little bit busy. Good. Yeah. Good. So yeah, I mean, get a lot of go. stuff done. Yep. Uh, JockoFuel.com. Get get some milk. That's a big one. Yeah. It's such a good little, it's almost like a trick. It is like a it's trick. It's like a trick that you can have something that tastes delicious and it's good for you. You know, And it's providing you the protein that you need to get stronger. You know the expression, uh, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is? Yeah. This one is not. It's that. It's not too go, good man. to be true. It's bro. actually too good and okay. true. It's good and true. Yeah. Milk. And I said it before, I'll say it again, that, man, it's not, especially if you're on the path you're lifting. Lifting is a big one, but if you're if you're really working out and you're trying to get that additional protein, it's hard to get the required, recommended amount of protein. Mm-hmm. It's harder than you think. So add to that one. It's yeah, easy now. Not if you got that trick. Easy now. No. Yeah. Uh, Jockofuel.com. You can also get the drinks at Wawa. You can uh, check out the vitamin shop. They've got everything in there, too. So appreciate that. Go get it. Yep. Also, as far as supporting yourself, this podcast, and America, if you're going to get get some jeans, if you haven't already, go to originusa.com. This is where you can get your American-made jeans. Yeah. Yeah. It's real simple, you know? Oh, like, oh, it's cool. It's American-made. And then you, oh, yeah. And, and actually, you're you're helping defeat communism yeah. and tyrannical leaders in the world. Yeah. So you want a new pair of jeans? Great. Yeah. Get them from originusa.com. That's, that's a positive move. If you want to help stomp out tyrannical leadership in the world that's enslaving a bunch of people, you can also go to originusa.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get jujitsu stuff. It sounded like Dan was jujitsu curious. He, <laughs> he was jujitsu like, curious. He was kind of jujitsu curious. He was really at he the beach. Be- real. Word. I was out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right as I was coming in. Bro, he made it a point and he was, he was, he was a. Uh, Really interested to know how how do the tournaments how are the tournaments set up yeah. like do you have this you have that and you're right like right we didn't you came in and we had to kind of record but I didn't realize that yeah they don't have they don't have a, like an adaptive division yeah jujitsu is adaptive you just go you adapt yeah yeah and you figure it out and by the way like what's your weight class because mm-hmm. Dan probably if he had legs would probably be one seventy. He's going to be in some, with some 128 pounders. I have no yep. idea what his actual weight is, but he's right. definitely going to be for his size and strength. Upper yep. body is going to be a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, and but there and there are. Do, do I want to say a lot? Or there, there's not a lot, but it's not a rarity to be like to to see a guy with one leg, no one legs, arm. competing yep. in yep. jujitsu yep. and winning. Yep. So there are like very definitive adaptive techniques it that happens. go in and are very effective in there. So. Yeah, to train that jujitsu. Train that jujitsu. The jujitsu is for everybody. That's the, that's the bottom line. The jujitsu is for everybody. Where is it? Where did you get that from? I just said it today. No, for the but first you time. said it right there with a little bit of an accent. No, you know why? Because everybody, you mm-hmm. could separate it oh, into two yeah. words, and you have a little pun, okay. right? Everybody. Yeah. yeah. And everybody. Back in the day, okay. Remember Stuart Cooper? Stuart yep. Cooper yep. films. Yep. So he did a video with Hobson Mora. And okay. that, that's what it was called, Jiu Jitsu is for everybody. And that's how you sounded kind of like him. Oh, I thought okay. it was from that video. That, well, was, good. that was my favorite Stuart Cooper video. Sometimes my Brazilian Portuguese accent comes out, you know, <laughs> from my youth. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Also, Jocko Store, you want to represent while you're on the path? Discipline equals freedom shirts and hats and hoodies. Some good stuff to say good. And also some creative designs. If you want a new one every month as a subscription, what check was out the, the, what shirt was the last locker. shirt locker shirt that came out. 
The last one. Uh, Do you even know? Everybody must. Get, no, no, no. There's one. Everybody called, must get stoned. Yeah, but that's not the that's most the recent controversial one. one. Yeah. What's the What's the mo- most recent one? Uh, it's Again? called Good High Level Problems. Oh dang! Check you know that what out. It, it's good. Wrote in like what do you call it? like a script? Yeah, like a real elegant yeah. script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the the, the logos, like, yeah. You got to. Why it does it say it's high good. level problems? Because like you know, you know, <laughs> you know the what do you call the aristocrats? Right. That's uh, how it looks. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. No. Now here, you want to know the layers? Okay. <clears throat> so I, I I always say or we always kind of talk about how like. People now, or it's been said that people now, they're complaining about like dumb stuff, mm, right? right? Everyone's offended or yeah, all this. First stuff. world problems. Probably. First world yeah, problems. Yeah. The idea, that's like, the thing is, sure, it can be viewed as bad, especially when you compare it to real problems, quote unquote, real problems, mm-hmm. but it's only natural to have these problems. And if they're problems, they still need to be solved. Most of them can be solved with attitude, of course, yeah. <laughs> rather than, you know, killing a bunch so of enemies. first world problem, good. It's essentially, no, no, no. It means first world problems need to be solved just like any other problem. Yeah. No matter how easy or hard, but they still exist. But you still have to have the same attitude. You got to have the good attitude, the same good attitude. Yeah. Exactly. It's just right. a higher level good. High. Quote unquote higher level. There yes. you go. All right. So there you go. Sherlocker. There you go. Get some of that. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, JockoUnderground.com. We've been ra- rolling out some Jocko Underground. Pretty interesting yeah. topics coming out there. Talking about various things on earth and answering a lot of questions. JockoUnderground.com. If you want to help us with our own little platform that we've got going, just in case we get banned, just in case we get censored. Yeah. What else? Banned, censored, yeah, no more. Banned and censored, uh, canceled, canceled, whatever. You know, I mean, I I don't think, well, then again, I, I don't know nowadays. Because remember, YouTube, you could say pretty much whatever as far as like actual words. Like, mm-hmm. you know how they're swearing on YouTube, yeah, right? Yeah. That was never a thing. No. And then there's certain like words that they like make it a point to like bleep out so their channel doesn't get canceled. Oh. Like there's people I listen to and they like oh, cut yeah. out the words. I've heard that. But the words that you're talking about are words like COVID. Have you yeah. ever heard uh, yeah. podcasts like that where they're oh, yeah. saying the word COVID and they edit it out? Yeah. Yeah. Or ha- or like half the word. It's weird. So that just makes me kind of weird. It, not, it doesn't make me nervous, but it makes me think. Like, yeah. wait a second. Why are they doing that? Because they might have got canceled or demonetized or what? It's That's like, why we have jockounderground.com. Because exactly, we, right. we can't control these other platforms. Yeah. But we, we, meaning all of us, we all control jockounderground.com. So if you want to support that, check it out. Check out YouTube, by the way. Hopefully we you can watch this episode, even though I just said COVID. With no frame of reference whatsoever. I just said the word. Twice now. Three times, I think. <laughs> so hopefully you can see us on there. Uh, subscribe to it. Check out the Origin USA channel as well. Mm-hmm. If you want to know what's happening there. Mm-hmm. Uh, psychological Warfare. Don't forget about Ty- Dakota Meyer. Making cool stuff to hang on your wall. It's uh, flipsidecanvas.com. I've written a bunch of books. Check them out. We got Echelon Front Leadership Consulting. Inside of Echelon Front, we have the Extreme Ownership Academy. And this is <clears throat> guidance on life. Guidance on life, how to interact with other human beings, which is what you're doing. Mm-hmm. That's what we all do. We have to do it, whether it's just the person that you live with, mom, dad, brother, sister, husband, wife, whether it's your landlady across the hallway, you gotta build a relationship with her so you don't get evicted. Yep. So if you wanna help learn to build relationships, help have a better life, go to extremeownership.com for the academy. If you want to help service members active and retired, their families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. It's America's Mighty Warriors.org if you want to donate or you want to get involved. And don't forget about heroesandhorses.com. Micah Fink, getting people out into the wilderness for sure. Echo and I, we're both on Twitter. We're on the gram, we're on the Facebook. But listen, come, fair warning. Better watch out for that algorithm because it's looking to grab you right by the throat and pull you back in. Actually, it doesn't grab you by the throat. It grabs you by like by like a gentle kind of like handhold <laughs> and it kind of lures you in there. It's not aggressive. By the, uh, uh, what's the, br- amygdala. 
Yeah, I don't know. If it's it grabs you by the by gray, the gray matter. By the gray matter, and just eases you into the algorithm. Next thing you know, you look up and you you just wasted seventeen minutes of your life. <laughs> Looking at a bunch of stupid things. So watch out for that. Uh, thanks once again to Dan Knossen for coming on. And thanks, Dan, for everything you've done. Everything you've done for America, for the teams, and the way you represent America in the Olympics. Awesome. And like I said, it's it's awesome for, for me to think that no matter what, no matter what's going on in your world, you're out there getting after it. That is an example for all of us to follow. And thanks to all the service men and women who have paid the price of freedom in blood. We are only here because of your sacrifice, and we thank you for it. And thanks to all the work done by our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, and all first responders out there. You also sacrifice so that we can be safe and we are grateful for what you do and to everyone else out there whatever whatever excuse you have whatever justification you make up in your head whatever rationalization you allow to go on in your mind just stop it just stop it the excuses and the justifications and the rationalizations are not Valid and we know that We know that because of guys like Dan Kanasan who face incredible challenges But he doesn't make excuses he takes action He overcomes he drives on so let's all of us be more like Dan and go out there every day and get after it and until next time this is Echo and Jocko.